China's economy is crashing, and Chinese youth's morale has hit a new low. Young people in China have so little hope in CCP that they have given up on trying and are choosing to be full-time children. Instead of finding a job or starting a business, they are depending on their parents and hoping for a salary for just living with them. Now, we already know everything going on with the Chinese real estate market, but now effects are spreading. Stock market is crashing, companies are leaving China, and Chinese youth are giving up on their future. All the while, CCP is only making things worse for its citizens. In an environment where the CCP needs more businesses to come to China to stimulate the economy, the communist government is raiding and harassing foreign businesses in Beijing to scare them away. So in this video, let's go over exactly how bad the shape of the Chinese economy is in, and why the CCP is hell-bent on making it worse. First and foremost, as usual, please drop a like on the video. It only takes you a sec and plays a huge role in overcoming the algorithm that doesn't like our videos very much. Let's start with the Chinese youth and how their situation got so bad. We feel like we've shown this chart hundreds of times in our past videos, but here's China's GDP over the past few decades. They've experienced an explosive growth in their economy as China opened up to the world and became the global manufacturing hub. This led to noticeable improvements in people's lives. We can see that if we just look at GDP per capita, millions of people who were born in underdeveloped villages in rural China were pulled out of poverty and now are living a pretty respectable middle class life. That's a huge advancement in the span of a few decades. If we look at China's income graph, we can see that in 1990, the average Chinese citizen was making $330 annually, and by 2019, that figure is close to $10,000. That kind of increase in a nation of a billion plus people is no small feat. The government did have to do a lot of forceful and questionable stuff to achieve this, but it's still impressive. The main issue here is that there were a lot of questionable policies along the way that the government implemented that are coming back to haunt them now. One of these policies was the one-child policy. China's one-child policy devastated generations of families over its 35 years in effect. Great-grandmother, down through five generations, this family is a perfect example of China's population crisis. There's only one great-great-grandchild. Chinese couples now have official permission to have more babies. The government today got rid of its highly unpopular one-child policy and said couples can now have two children. Fearing overpopulation, the CCP forced families to only have one kid. As most of us could have guessed, this led to many problems that we're going to need a whole separate video to cover. But here's a quick summary of what's important for this topic. Because of the CCP's one-child policy, it's expected that soon the country will have more older people than young workers. Here's China's demographic period in 1980, around the time the one-child policy went into effect. This is great for any nation. A lot of working adults and kids. Adults are productive members of the economy right now, and kids will be productive members of society in the coming future. The older population? Well, they already put in their hard work, so now they get to live off of the work from the economically productive members of the society. That's why any growing economy usually has a lot of productive members and a smaller number of non-productive members. But due to the one-child policy, China's population wasn't able to replace itself. Think about it. You need two kids just to replace the parents in the future, and maybe a little bit more to make up for any unexpected deaths. That's why the replacement birth rate is around 2.1. But due to the CCP's policy, this is what China's demographic period is supposed to look like in the coming decades. A lot more older people in their retirement, less working age people, and even less kids, which means the future is looking pretty bleak. Coming back to our topic about China's youth, there is a lot of cultural pressure on them. Older generation who worked hard and witnessed China's exponential growth now have their expectations set high. They expect their kids to continue the same progress for the family and the country. They expect the current generation of workers to get a higher education, get a high paying job, and continue building towards a better life for the family. This is not to say that other cultures don't have the same expectations for their kids, but in China, this expectation is a bit unrealistic with the way the CCP is managing the economy. Because of Chinese culture, a lot of adults are expected to take care of their parents, and sometimes even their grandparents too. Then on top of that, they are expected to constantly succeed in their work life, save up for a house, get married, and keep progressing. This is already too much pressure on a working population that is shrinking in China, but the problems don't stop there. These are tough days in China for many who are young, looking for work, and just not finding it. In May, the youth unemployment rate hit a new high nearly four times the national level. It's unclear as to exactly what is going to propel 
this economy forward. Currently, China's youth unemployment rate sits at a jaw-dropping 20%. Nearly one in five young workers don't have a job. This is in part due to the Bailan movement, but also in part due to there not being enough jobs. In the early 2010s, the CCP made a heavy push to get China's students to pursue higher education, which sounds like a great thing, and it usually is. The more educated a population becomes, the better it is for the economy. But in China's case, everything didn't go according to plan. The CCP expected China to be a more mature economy by now, but China's economy is still driven mainly by low-income manufacturing jobs. So when the government pushes students towards higher education, these students expect high-income, high-skilled jobs when they graduate. And now, the CCP is realizing that there just aren't enough jobs for all these highly educated graduates. This is creating intense competition between graduates to land what little jobs China's economy does have to offer. In this situation, any competent government would tailor policies to attract foreign companies that need this labor and promote more business activity locally so that graduates can find jobs. But what does the CCP do? The exact opposite, as we will get into soon. When you factor all this in, you can see why finding a job is getting harder and harder for China's youth, and the CCP has been no help. And then, COVID hit. When Wuhan was locked down at the end of January, a city of 11 million people quarantined. By December the 11th, up to 200 people were likely infected with the coronavirus. Administration official says the White House is considering more travel restrictions. Tonight, Americans are scrambling to get out of Wuhan, China, on a charter flight organized by the State Department. Even though the CCP did a good job containing the spread during the early days of COVID, you can't say the same for 2022. When COVID cases spiked again in Chinese cities in 2022, the CCP went on an all-out war to achieve its utopian goal of zero COVID. Brutal lockdowns killed countless businesses and stifled any economic bounce back that China's businesses had been working towards. The global economy was also slowing down, which heavily impacted China and its local job market. As you can see, the job market is shrinking more and more, and cultural pressure to be successful is piling up on China's youth as they get older. As we have discussed in previous videos, much like the American dream, the Chinese dream is to get a job and then buy real estate. Real estate holds a very important significance in Chinese culture. Men with real estate are considered high status and more suitable for marriage. Going back to the CCP's one-child policy, since families were only allowed one child, a lot of them favored having a boy over a girl. This has led to a drastic mismatch in the male-to-female ratio in China. There are about 70 million more men than women in China. This makes the competition for marriage even more intense, much like job market competition. This is part of the reason why real estate prices have been skyrocketing in China over the past few decades. And before someone comments, let us clarify. We're not saying this is the only reason behind the real estate bubble. There are many other factors that play a bigger role. But marriage desirability is a small part of the reason behind the price rise in China. Even though the real estate bubble seems to be popping in China, buying an apartment is still very much out of reach for many households. In fact, if we look at this chart from 2016, we can see that many Chinese cities rank in the top 10 worst cities in terms of home prices versus average income of residents. Things haven't improved much now either. We can't find a chart, but here's a table with the same data. You can see there are still many Chinese cities in the top 10. So, real estate ownership is important in China if you want to progress in life, but it's nearly impossible to buy based on average Chinese salaries. Jobs are getting incredibly hard to get because of intense competition for the small numbers of jobs that are available when compared to a large pool of prospects. If you are lucky enough to get a job, working culture in China is intense, especially when compared to the salaries being paid. It's common to see the 9 to 9 to 6 work schedule in China, meaning you work from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week, all while making very little. And if you dare complain about anything, employers have all the leverage since they can replace you in a heartbeat due to the high demand for any job opening. As the situation kept getting worse and worse, and the CCP was doing very little to improve the economy, a movement started brewing in China. There is an undercurrent of dissatisfaction brewing among the young in China. Quiet quitting have racked up more than 150 million views on social media app TikTok. At the time when the job market was hit hard by the nation's economic slowdown, some started thinking, why not just lie flat? 
Chinese youth have started giving up on trying in an attempt to force the government to improve the situation. So far, on Weibo, the related hashtag has accumulated over 93.2 million views, and searching for the phrase on Zhao Hongzhu results in over 2.6 million user-generated content UGC instances. It's spreading so quickly that the CCP has actually started censoring the keywords online. Talking about censorship, some of the videos we're making on this channel are sometimes considered too controversial for YouTube, and the almighty algorithm may not recommend them to you. So, if you guys can take a quick second to hit that subscribe button, it would help us out a lot. Young people have burned out after trying so hard for so long to no avail. This is how they make sense of it in their mind. Someone has to be a loser because of the way the economy is set up. Too many people and not enough jobs. Real estate prices are too high and salaries ain't. So why try so hard if you know you are just going to fail? If you don't try at all, then at least you are not disappointed when you inevitably lose. So that's basically the thinking behind the whole let it rot movement. We know it sounds crazy to some older folks, but that's how it's being looked at in China. Have you guys ever played a game where you are losing so badly that you just stop trying? Because there's no chance you are making a comeback, so why not at least save the energy? Well, that's pretty similar to how Chinese youth are feeling towards life. Even though it may sound silly to some, this is turning into a serious problem for the future of China's economy and the communist government. CCP officials have publicly come out and said that this attitude will slow China's growth and will result in generations of slackers. State media has already started publishing articles about why the youth should avoid bylaw and refuse that mindset. But so far, the movement is not slowing down. Recent data only shows that things are getting worse. Most recent filing by CCP shows that youth unemployment sits at 21.3 percent. Keep in mind, CCP is known for padding statistics to make things look better than they actually are in reality. So if it is publishing 21.3 youth unemployment, there's a good chance reality is worse. So after this report went viral, the Chinese government said that it would stop publishing this information from now on. We're guessing CCP thinks that if we don't publish the problem, everyone will think everything's fine. Unfortunately. That's not how the world works. The decision to scrub a widely watched report exasperated the concerns by investors and executives who say ever tightening government control of information is making it harder to do business in China. First, let's cover why investors are scared, which is causing a crash in the Chinese stock market. China is facing a potential debt crisis. In the non-financial sector, debt as a share of China's GDP has surged from 200% to 300% in the 12 years that Xi Jinping has been in office. Government debt, corporate debt, and household debt levels in China are incredibly high. Although the government would almost certainly intervene to prevent a large-scale financial crisis, it will only create a bigger problem for itself further down the line. On top of all of these macro issues, Xi Jinping also seems hell bent on scaring away foreign businesses too. Last month, China's newly revised counter espionage law expanded the definition of what could be construed as spying, a reflection of Xi's heightened security state. The law alarmed foreign businesses and governments because it stipulated that sharing documents, data, materials, and objects could be considered spying if the information had a bearing on national security and interests. A criteria seen as overly broad and potentially arbitrary. U.S. firms in China have long complained about what they have seen as an unfair business environment, with limited protection for intellectual property and preferential treatment afforded to domestic competitors. Those fears have been compounded this year by a broad crackdown on U.S. consulting firms operating in China. Earlier this year, Chinese authorities raided American consulting firms, Mintz Group, and Bain and Company. CCP claims that it was for national security reasons, but the true reason becomes more clearer once we look at what these firms were working on. There's one topic relating to CCP that we haven't covered on this channel yet, but we're sure you guys know about it already. The topic is CCP's treatment of Uyghur Muslims in China's Xinjiang region. One day we'll release a detailed video on the topic, just waiting to figure out how to tell that story without getting age restricted by YouTube. Anyways, coming back to the topic on hand, because of reports about CCP's treatment on Uyghur Muslims, United States passed Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, a U.S. federal law that changed U.S. policy on the Xinjiang region, with the goal of ensuring that American entities were not funding forced labor among ethnic minorities in that region. It was signed into law by U.S. President Joe Biden on December 23, 2021, and stated that commencing 21st of June 2022, any company that imports goods from Xinjiang region needed to certify that those goods were not produced using forced labor in order to avoid U.S. penalties. Many companies who operated in China hired consulting firms like Mintz to help carry out the research in their supply chains in Xinjiang province. 
As soon as these firms started looking into the issue, they were raided for national security reasons by the CCP. We think you guys get what CCP is really trying to hide. This also kind of sends a signal to foreign businesses and investors that doing business in China is not a safe move. Because of all these issues and more, foreign investment in China is down to a 25-year low. Direct investment liabilities, a gauge of foreign direct investment in China, slumped to just $4.9 billion in the April-June period, according to figures released by the State Administration of Foreign Exchange. That was down 87% from the same period last year, and was the smallest amount in any quarter in data back to 1998. Firms are reinvesting less of their existing profits back into the country and are choosing to bring excess money back to their home. This all led to Chinese stock prices to slide for most of this year. China's benchmark CSI 300 index was down around 4.2% this year as of writing of this script. Global investors have become net sellers of Chinese shares, with outflows from Chinese domestic stocks by foreign institutional investors reaching $10.2 billion so far in August. In hope of reviving the confidence in its market, CCP cut a tax on trading which did help stock gain a little, but the gains were quickly wiped out. The new measures don't fully address investors' concerns. Investors feel bearish on the economic recovery of China. Changes in taxes don't address the issues with the economy. Economic outlook is looking so bad that CCP is stopping economists and analysts from publishing their true thoughts on China's economy. Many experts outside of China believe that China may be experiencing a similar slowdown to that of Japan in the 1990s. Back then, a bursting asset price bubble triggered Japan's lost decade, resulting in a 30-year period of stagnation. Economic growth slumped from averaging 4.5% year-on-year through the 1980s to 1% ever since. Economists do not expect growth to fall quite so low in China, but the end result for China will be worse. That's because China is experiencing this pressure at much lower levels of per capita income than Japan did. Although Japan's economy slumped, it remained a wealthy nation. China might be the world's second largest economy, but its GDP per capita in 2022 was just 12,756. That is roughly a sixth of that in the US, and barely above the global average. If it stagnates now, China will be stuck in the middle income trap. Xi's Chinese dream will die. This is a Chinese vessel blinding a Filipino fisherman using lasers in Philippine territory. <laughs> Earlier, a big Chinese ship purposely collided with a Philippine Coast Guard vessel. It's not just Philippines. China has regularly and aggressively sent fighter jets into Taiwan territory and fired missiles over Taiwanese island. A Chinese warship cut across the bow of an American-guided missile destroyer, transiting the Taiwan Strait. China has also sent ships and jets in Malaysia and Indonesian waters to harass the oil drilling operation in both countries' territories. This continuing and growing bullying by China has forced many nations to turn to the USA. In an effort to stop the Chinese advance, the US military has come up with a new strategy. A strategy to surround China and be ready to fight in case there's ever a major escalation. This strategy is the US plan to not only help smaller nations, but also stop CCP from exerting its influence over international waters. So in today's video, let's talk about the US's new strategy to trap China and how it will cement the world order. Before jumping in, we have a quick rant about the state of today's news organizations. News companies are just focused on being divisive and enraging. That's because that's what gets the engagement, which gets more eyeballs, which means more money. We're not gonna lie, Regular viewers of the channel know that sometimes we have taken clickbaits a bit too far just to get you guys to watch the video. That's the problem with news that is served by an algorithm. We put tens if not one hundreds of hours into making a video, covering important news, but at the end of the day, if we can't convince you to click, all the effort is wasted. This phenomenon is far worse than the news companies, who have special positions just to get clicks on their news. These experts have figured out that the best way to get clicks is to scare the public, focus on negative stories, and blow every event out of proportion. But that's not what news is supposed to be. That's why we launched Global Recaps. Every weekday, an email is sent directly to your inbox. In it, we cover the world's most important news in a short and concise manner, with links to read more if you're interested in any specific news. We also take the most important news story and break it down in simple terms to explain how it affects you and everyone else. These emails take less than five minutes to read, and they make you more informed about the world you live in, about the good, the bad, and the neutral. They are meant to keep you informed, not scare you. If you think these emails can be helpful to you, then you can sign up now by scanning the QR code on screen or clicking the link in the description. Now let's get back to the basics. 
Before jumping into the US's plan, let's quickly go over why China is willing to fight so many countries over the South China Sea. The South China Sea is a marginal sea in the Pacific Ocean bounded by South China, the Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia. This region is believed to have around 28 billion barrels of oil reserves, 266 trillion cubic feet of natural gas, and holds one third of the entire world's marine biodiversity, thereby making it a very important area for the ecosystem, even if fish stocks in the area are rapidly depleting. If all these weren't reason enough, the South China Sea is a very important trade route, and as of 2019, around 3.37 trillion USD worth of global trade passes through this region annually. The main route to and from the Pacific and Indian Ocean ports is through the Strait of Malacca and the South China Sea. Generally, oil and minerals move north, and food and manufactured goods move south. As we have covered in our previous videos, China is heavily dependent on oil imports to fuel its economy and its industries. Roughly 50% of Chinese oil imports come from the Middle East, and that oil sails through the South China Sea. And as you guys have already heard the last 1,000 times we've said it, China is the world's manufacturing hub and its economic growth is fueled by selling those manufactured goods to the rest of the world. A big part of China's exports flow through the South China Sea to the rest of the world, so we're sure you guys can see that the South China Sea is very important to China. But does that mean it belongs to China? Um, we're not quite sure. Let's look at China's supposed claim to this area in just a sec. But first, let's go over the international law that defines who controls what part of the ocean. Just a quick reminder to hit the like button to help out the video against the CCP bots. Coming back to the topic, according to the Law of the Sea, that was signed in UN Convention in 1982, each country's sovereign territorial waters extend to a maximum of 12 nautical miles, 22 kilometers, beyond its coast, but foreign vessels are granted the right of innocent passage through this zone. Beyond its territorial waters, every coastal country may establish an exclusive economic zone, EEZ, extending 200 nautical miles, 370 kilometers from shore. Now, remember this, as this will become really important later in the video. Within the EEZ, the coastal state has the right to exploit and regulate fisheries, construct artificial islands and installations, and use the zones for other economic purposes. Now, every country recognizes this law, including China. This is actually how every country has claimed their part of the South China Sea, 200 nautical miles from their coast, every country but China. There are some overlaps in Vietnamese, Malaysian, Brunus, and Filipino claims, but no one is talking much about that because, well, all these countries are united together against China's claim. You see, when it comes to this part of the sea, China doesn't want to follow the law of the sea. No, no, no. In fact, China wants to follow this made-up 9 dash line to exert its claim. This 9 dash line covers almost 90% of the South China Sea, and the CCP claims that it's all part of China. Now, you may ask, what's the reasoning behind the 9 dash line, since there are no laws or anything that mentions this? Well, according to the CCP's reasoning, a Chinese explorer discovered the South China Sea, so therefore, it belongs to China. We guess by the same reasoning, China belongs to Italy because Marco Polo discovered China. Time for CCP to pack up and hand over the reins to the Italians. Jokes aside, that is the reasoning the CCP has used to claim pretty much the whole South China Sea, and it has led to some very confrontational situations with other countries. Fresh tensions over a long-standing dispute. A renewed war of words between China and the Philippines today. We're now being surrounded by Chinese vessels. They've sailed really, really close to us, as close as a few meters from us. As territorial disputes in the South China Sea continue. Aggressive and offensive, the Chinese Coast Guard appears to block the supply boat's path. How are you? So leave this area immediately. Any consequences in town for will be brought by you. To assert their claim, several countries in the conflict officially renamed the region that they claimed. In September 2012, the Philippine president signed an administrative order maintaining that all government agencies use the same West Philippine Sea to refer to the parts of the South China Sea within the Philippines. Similarly, in 2017, Indonesia renamed the northern reaches of its exclusive economic zone in the South China Sea as the North Natuna Sea in an attempt to assert its sovereignty. All while this is happening, the CCP starts building its own island in the South China Sea. Not just any islands, military islands. They were home to few military personnel, an airstrip, and a missile system. 
Based on international law, these islands were within the Philippines' border, so the Philippines decided to take China to UN court. In 2016, a ruling from the Hog ruled in favor of the Philippines, claiming China had indeed encroached their land, a ruling that the CCP chose to ignore and has not put into effect yet. To make matters worse, the CCP declared the airspace above the disputed land to be a defensive air identification zone, and issued a notice that aircrafts flying through it would need Chinese permission. This move, while they claim will only be enforced in defense, has further strained relations between the countries. On top of this, there was a second part of this ruling that was just as important to the whole conflict. You guys remember earlier how we said that according to the law of the sea, 200 nautical miles from the coast is each country's exclusive economic zone. Well, so there are a group of islands in the middle of the South China Sea, called the Spratly Islands, that all the countries are trying to claim. The main reason being that if you can establish a claim on the island, you can extend your EEZ and control more of the South China Sea. But according to a 2016 ruling, the Spratly Islands were ruled a rock, so it doesn't extend any country's EEZ. This kind of killed the importance of the islands, but that doesn't mean conflict calmed down. China has been using something called the Cabbage Strategy, or the Salami Slicing Strategy, to choke out supplies to foreign lands. To accomplish this, China will surround a foreign-controlled island with its ships and destroyers to deny access to rival nations, and then try to subsequently claim the islands. Now, of course, the United States has a lot of allies in this conflict, and we have the strongest navy in the world. One important part that the US Navy plays is maintaining peace at sea, so world trade can continue without interruption. So since China was being so aggressive in the South China Sea, the US Navy has increased its presence there to keep peace. This is where the new US military plan starts. In fact, this was a plan that started soon after the end of World War II. To counter the Soviet Union and Communist China's maritime ambitions, the United States crafted the island chain strategy. As the Soviet Union collapsed and Communist China grew, a similar strategy has been used to contain China. Two island chains in the Western Pacific are noteworthy. The first comprises the Kuril Islands, the main Japanese archipelago, Okinawa, the northern part of the Philippine archipelagos, the Malay Peninsula, and Taiwan. The second chain consists of the islands of Japan stretching to Guam and the islands of Micronesia. America was able to set up bases or form partnerships with countries to solve its biggest hurdle. The US military had a problem in the Western Pacific, the tyranny of distance and time. Delivering military force across the vast Pacific Ocean has never been easy, even for a country as blessed in resources and ingenuity as the United States. If the Chinese army were to launch a rapid attack, it would be able to move a lot faster than the American Navy could respond if it weren't for the island chain. American forces located outside the conflict area would have to penetrate China's anti-access area denial, A2AD, network to restore the status quo that was there beforehand. A daunting proposition. Under these circumstances, Washington might face the unenviable choice of doing nothing or escalating to higher levels of violence. Either way, the national interests of both the United States and its closest allies would suffer dramatically. This is where the first island chain strategy was very helpful in stationing American troops and weapons near the possible battle zone. The main goal of being so close to China is twofold. First, by being ready to defend the area from Chinese aggression, the USA strategic forces are hoping to deter China from launching an assault in the first place. But this strategy only holds true as long as China believes that the US Navy can defeat it. History shows that deterrence is more likely to fail when an aggressor believes it can pull off an attack successfully. If Chinese leadership believes it can achieve gains through aggression quickly and without paying steep costs in blood, money, and reputation, it may be tempted to escalate a crisis to open conflict. This is where island chains are not only set up as a way to support allies, but also as a way to blockade the Chinese inside in case of an assault. As covered earlier, China is a big importer of oil. In fact, China imports almost double the amount of oil that the USA does, and the majority of that oil flows from the Middle East, which is transported through the Indian Ocean. All this oil passes through what some might consider one of the most important geopolitical choke points, here in the Strait of Malacca. It's projected that 80% of China's oil flows through this strait. This strait is the territorial waters of Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. This strait is a very big weakness for China. In case of any war or political disagreement, this strait could easily be blocked off by enemies, like India or the USA. Without access to this route, it's very hard for China to get energy to fuel its economy, let alone a war. In today's world, oil is the lifeblood of the economy and its government. The CCP can only survive for so many days with a mostly halted economy. 
That's why, as China's economy grew, the CCP became more aware of its shortcomings and invested heavily in improving its military and navy to avoid getting in the situation where another country controlled the sea routes that China depended on. CCP realized that to become the dominant power in Asia, China must first become the preeminent power in the first island chain. According to the U.S. Department of Defense's military and security developments involving the People's Republic of China 2019 report, China has been establishing communication, aviation and port facilities, fixed weapon positions, and barracks in the Spratly Islands since 2018. Developing a strong and permanent military presence in the first island chain will give China control of the major shipping routes in Asia and help in establishing itself as a dominant global power. The Chinese Coast Guard, CCG, frequently harasses fishing and survey vessels of other claimant states in the South China Sea. In 2020, a Chinese warship laser tagged a Philippine Navy ship. A Chinese survey vessel, Haiyong DZ 8, illegally entered Malaysia's maritime exclusive economic zone and tailed a Malaysian state owned oil company's contracted ship. On the 22nd of May 2020, Beijing announced an $178.2 billion military budget, an increase of 6.6% from 2019. Also in May, the CCG harassed Japanese fishing vessels in the Daiyu Senkaku Islands. The militarization of contested islands and harassment of foreign vessels from Daiyu Senkaku down to the Malay Peninsula exposes China's intention and strategy to control the first island chain. On top of overpowering the first island chain, CCP is also trying to build infrastructure and the world to overcome this obstacle. Many experts have pointed out that CCP's flagship belt and road initiative is a way of making sure that China has reduced its dependency on the Pacific Ocean routes. China has built pipelines both in Myanmar and Pakistan, from the coast to inner city China. It secured long port leases in Pakistan and Sri Lanka. Similarly, China has also set up a military base in Djibouti to control Bab el Mandeb, a vital strait off the coast of Djibouti that links the Red Sea to the Indian Ocean. Persian Gulf and Asian exports bound for Western markets must first pass through Bab el Mandeb before reaching the Suez Canal. Between 12.5 and 20% of all global trade passes through this strait. Only 8 miles from China's base is Camp Lemanire. As China got stronger, it made moves to set itself free of the island chain. This left many Pacific Ocean countries worried that China is preparing for increased aggression and bullying near Taiwan and South China Sea. It's not just the first island chain that China is targeting, it's also building up strength to overcome the second island chain in the middle of the Pacific. Just a reminder, the second chain consists of the islands of Japan stretching to Guam and the islands of Micronesia. China's presence in the second island chain would give Beijing control of the middle of the Pacific, which serves as a strategic military and economic outpost. The U.S.'s withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership in 2017 has emboldened China to fill the vacuum of influence in the Western Pacific. In September 2019, China's economic support for the Solomon Islands led the Pacific state to switch its diplomatic recognition of Taiwan to China. Soon after, Kiribati followed suit. In December 2019, China vowed to provide economic assistance for infrastructure development to Micronesia. Notably, Micronesia could serve as a strategic location for China to counter American military presence in Guam. However, the U.S. has agreements with Micronesia, Palau, and the Marshall Islands, the Compacts of Free Association, which gives the U.S. exclusive access to the land, sea, and air routes of these island states. Although China courts the Pacific Islands with promises of economic investments, they are still traditionally tied to the U.S. This fact adds difficulty for China, as a military presence without a strategic basing to penetrate the second island chain will be hard to achieve. But coming back to the South China Sea, China's actions have left the USA with two choices, either strengthen the first island chain to gain back the advantage in deterrence strategy, or ditch protecting American allies in the Pacific Ocean. So obviously, America has stepped its efforts to reinforce the first island chain to safeguard its allies' interests. Just this year, the U.S. Marine Corps marked the opening of a new base on America's westernmost Pacific island, Guam. This will be the first new Marine base since 1952 and will house 5,000 Marines charged in the short term with deterring and detecting threats in the region. Longer term, the Guam base, almost equidistant from Japan and Taiwan, is also stated to be a hub for Marines on Guam and across the northern Mariana Islands to train for protecting Pacific islands, including vital sea lanes, in the event of an invasion. If there is a conflict with China, the Marines would be among the first ground forces to respond. Around the same time, the USA reached an agreement with the Philippines that gives the US access to four military camps in the country. Even though this doesn't give US military permanent bases there, it does give US troops, rotating in and out of the Philippines, a bird's eye view of two critical spots. 
the Taiwan Strait, and disputed regions of the South China Sea. There are about 500 US troops in the Philippines on any given day, but thousands rotate in and out over the course of a year for military exercises, humanitarian aid, training, and other missions, according to officials. The Philippines allow American forces to stay in barracks within designated Philippine camps. The US already had access to five Philippine military bases. On top of this, the US would also increase its deployment of advanced military assets to the Korean Peninsula, including fighter jets and aircraft carriers to boost joint training and planning. Additionally, US and Japan agreed to adjust the American troop presence on the island of Okinawa in part to enhance anti-ship capabilities that would be needed in the event of a Chinese incursion into Taiwan or other hostile acts in the South or East China Sea. They also added a formal mention of outer space in the long-standing U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, making clear that attacks to, from, and within space could trigger the mutual defense provisions of the treaty, and Japan announced it would begin constructing a pair of runways on the small southern island of Mangashima, where joint exercises, amphibious operations, and missile interception could begin in about four years. The island would be a hub for troop deployments and munition supplies in case of a conflict like a Taiwan emergency. The changes in the U.S. deployment on Okinawa will transform the 12th Marine Regiment into a smaller, more rapidly mobile unit. The 12th Marine Littoral Regiment, which will be better equipped to fight an adversary and defend the U.S. and its allies in the region. The U.S. is doing everything in its power to send the signal that if there's any aggression near the South China Sea, it will be far more of a guaranteed win for China. The goal of all this is deterrence by denial. The U.S. has also been busy diplomatically. The U.S. opened an embassy in the Solomon Islands this year in a direct effort to counter China's growing influence there. There had been an embassy in the Solomons for several years, but it was closed in 1993 as part of a global reduction in diplomatic posts. Over time, however, the U.S. became concerned about possible weakening ties with the country. The Solomon Islands switched allegiance from the self-ruled island of Taiwan to Beijing in 2019, and last year, the Solomons signed a security pact with China, raising fears of a military buildup by Beijing in the region. Reopening an embassy there, the U.S. State Department said, was a priority to counter China's growing influence in the region. The embassy in the capital, Honiara, is starting small, with a charge des affaires, a couple of State Department staff, and a handful of local employees. Just to add insult to injury, India has also started its strategy to encircle China and contain China's growing influence. After seeing all the moves China has been making, a lot of military experts have pointed out that the Belt and Road is not just a geoeconomic plan, it also has a military strategic advantage. The ports have increasingly come to play a potentially more menacing role as dual-use ports that can give the strengthened Chinese Navy a global reach it lacked entirely just a few years ago. These strategic investments are nicknamed the String of Pearls, as the goal is to encircle India and put pressure on New Delhi. India was aware of this already, but the war in Ukraine showed every country in the world how important it is to secure your economic interests. In the modern world, wars can be won and lost before even stepping a foot on the battlefield. India realized that, in the case of a war, China's string of pearls can be used as a way to choke off India's access to the world, on top of safeguarding Chinese interests. Adding to this, countries that received Chinese money were slow to criticize China whenever it would start skirmishes on the disputed border with India like it did in 2017 and 2020. There's also a rumor that China plans to start setting up military bases in countries that receive Chinese loans. And of course, this was undoubtedly stressful for New Delhi, as it didn't want to be surrounded by the Chinese military. So, India started laying out its own plan to safeguard its economic interests, but it didn't just stop there. Later in the video, we will go over how India is taking advantage of China's trade war with the USA to hurt China where it's the strongest, its manufacturing prowess. But first, let's go over how India is countering China's military. To counter the String of Pearls, India started its own alliances to encircle China, nicknamed the Necklace of Diamonds. India is expanding its naval bases and is also improving relations with strategically placed countries to counter China's strategies. In 2018, India partnered with Singapore and Indonesia to get access to their naval bases of Changi and Sabang. This increased India's influence and access to the Strait of Malacca, one of the most important choke points for China and the rest of the world in terms of trade. That same year, India also got military access to the port of Dukam in Oman. The port facilitates India's crude imports from the Corrosion Gulf. In addition to this, the Indian facility is located right between two important Chinese pearls, Djibouti in Africa and Gwadar in Pakistan. 
India has also signed an agreement with Seychelles for a naval base in the region, which will increase India's presence near the African continent. While doing this, India has also extended credit lines to Iran and agreed to build a port in the country to extend access to trade routes in Central Asia. Additionally, India has extended credit lines in Central Asia to countries like Mongolia, where Modi has agreed to develop a bilateral air corridor. New Delhi has invested a lot in policies to improve relationships with Japan and Vietnam. These relationships have helped increase Indian train and consequently India's influence on countries around China. This is Taiwan. This small island nation is filthy rich. When you look past the geopolitics that Taiwan is constantly dragged into and dare to shine the spotlight on its economy, what you get is this. Taiwan. 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 Industrial output rose 4.5% in August. The outlook for Taiwan's economy. Taiwan has benefited from export, which has benefited the economy as a whole. Taiwan even emerged as the second fastest growing economy in Asia after Japan. Taiwan grew its economy by more than 3% last year, growing faster than mainland China for the first time in decades. Taiwan has become a very rich nation over the past few decades, becoming home to many crucial companies, companies that the world simply cannot exist without. Its economic transformation from being a poor colony to being a powerful rich nation with powerful rich friends is one of the ages, and it deserves proper detailing, something we're going to do today. Throughout this video, we will examine the economic and political history of Taiwan, the reforms that has put into place over the years, and just how it has become richer than China. So buckle up, this is going to be an interesting story about an interesting nation. Do you know what else is interesting? The fact that by pressing the like button, you can help push the reach of this video on the algorithm. So please, take a second to like the video. It would mean a lot to us if the work we do gets to be accessed by more and more people who can learn from it, globally. Right, let's get back to the basics. In order to understand the present state of the nation, we need to start by looking at its past and what it is that paved the way for modern Taiwan to be where it is today. So let's have a crack at it. Looking at the history files, you'll find that very little is known about Taiwan before the 17th century when the Dutch arrived. When these Dutch came to the island nation in around 1622, they found a population mix of mainly the Austronesian Aborigines and a sprinkling of Chinese and Japanese people. The economic structure that existed at the time comprised the Aborigine women practicing subsistence agriculture while Aborigine men harvested deer for export. As for our handful of Chinese and Japanese people, the Chinese, most of them were merchants and they exported, surprise surprise, deer skins in exchange for salt and other basics. It was a simple economy done at a humble scale, but when the Dutch came, they decided to kick it up a notch. They built a harbor and their first fort in what is now present-day Tainan City, cementing what was already a trading ground as an important economic port. As time went by and the Dutch secured control over Taiwan, they made sure to benefit from the economy. They mostly didn't interfere with the economic ways of the people, but through taxation and new forms of agriculture, they made sure to benefit from the nation. The Tainan Harbor, on the other hand, as expected, grew in importance as an international entrepot. As more people, mostly Chinese, flocked to the bustling Taiwan from nearby shores, the island started growing more rice and sugar, with the latter soon becoming Taiwan's primary export. Even when Koxinga, a Chinese-Japanese sea lord, drove the Dutch off the island in 1661, the nation continued to grow its agriculture bit by bit, with minor changes taking place in the political arena, but economic growth being cemented either way. One thing to note was that all this time, the Chinese population was slowly growing in the nation. This is not surprising given where Taiwan is in reaction to China. Here's a reminder, when the Qing Dynasty, the last imperial dynasty in Chinese history, rose, it defeated Koxinga's grandson and took control of Taiwan in 1683. This is when Taiwan was integrated into the Chinese Empire. It would remain a part of the Chinese Empire until it was ceded to Japan in 1895. Some will say it still is part of the Chinese Empire, but we will get into that later on. The Qing government originally saw control of Taiwan as an economic burden that had to be borne in order to keep the island out of the hands of pirates. In the first years of occupation, the Qing government shipped as many Chinese residents as possible back to the mainland as they saw it as a non-crucial and non-productive area. Yes, the very same Taiwan that now has a higher GDP per capita than China was once viewed by China as useless. Talk about how tables turn. When the Qing Dynasty started shipping Chinese people back to China, the island lost over one-third of its Chinese population. 
China viewed Taiwan with such discontent that travel to Taiwan for anyone who wasn't a male migrant worker was made illegal until 1732. This facilitated illegal immigration to China, putting together the slow but natural increase of the population and the heavy illegal migration of people. The Chinese presence kept growing in Taiwan. Those who were on the island pushed the fold of economic progression in agriculture and entrepreneurial tasks. The original Aboriginal people learned also from these skill sets, and that further drove economic progression on the land. Remember when we said that Taiwan had become a primary sugar producer during the Dutch era? Well, the nation went on to prosper during a sugar boom in the early 18th century, but afterward, however, its sugar industry struggled. You see, the sugar farms and sugar mills remained in Taiwan's small-scale operations. When they had to compete against foreign production, they came up short, and hence the primary exports suffered. This led to the country becoming poorer, with particular emphasis on the south of the nation, where most of the sugar mills and sugar production had been taking place. Just like every empire and colonizer, the Qing Dynasty was not to last forever. However, something happened during the last years of the Qing Dynasty's rule in Taiwan that forever changed the landscape of modern global politics. You see, the Qing Dynasty made Taiwan a full province of China. That was a claim that for the next decades and in the next decades to come, and still to this modern day, will be a source of contention and massive geopolitics. After having passed through the hands of the Dutch and the Chinese, Taiwan eventually passed through the hands of the Japanese after the Sino-Japanese War. Japan's time ruling over Taiwan is particularly memorable because during this period, Japan endeavored to modernize the small island nation. You can say that Taiwan benefited a lot because it was basically Japan's first attempt at colonialism and they virtually wanted a little Tokyo in Taiwan. When the dust settled, economically speaking, the experiment was a raging success. By the time the Japanese left, it had successfully established order, eradicated disease, built infrastructure, and created a modern economy, the basis of what we have now. In fact, at the peak of its colonial period under Japan, Taiwan was the most advanced place in East Asia outside Japan itself. Japan came with the mindset that they were going to magnify what was already working and then remove all the barriers that existed. To this end, agriculture in Taiwan received a major boost. The policymakers in charge put a lot of emphasis on agriculture as it was the backbone of Taiwan. Through various policies, they improved rice production with new seeds and farming techniques to the point where there was more than enough internally and exports started again. Although sugarcane continued to be grown mainly on family farms, Sugar processing was modernized and sugar once again became Taiwan's leading export, further adding to the development of the economy. As Japan continually modernized Taiwan, large Japanese refiners holding regional monopoly power came to control the industry pushing it to its limits of development. This however, did not take the small refineries out of business, but it did mark a period of change and transition. Despite the modernization that Taiwan was going through, Taiwanese sugar remained uncompetitive on the international market. It, however, was sold duty-free within the protected Japanese market, meaning that it always had a market and it had one at competitive prices. At this time, all the new farming methods introduced by the Japanese also bore dividends as rice quickly rose to become Taiwan's second major export crop. Under Japanese rule, Taiwan's agricultural output shot up so high that by 1930, almost half of Taiwan's agricultural production was being exported. It wasn't just agriculture that prospered. The whole nation underwent a wave of modernization. Everything that could be developed was developed. The railroads that Taiwan barely had were expanded by a factor of almost 10 times just to propel the nation ahead. With new industries booming everywhere and trade expanding, Taiwan was electrified, which further served to grow said industries. Along with the railway that ran the length of the nation, modern roads and bridges were built. A modern land survey was carried out to better utilize available land to develop it. Large rents were eliminated, and those receiving these rents were compensated with bonds by the Japanese policymakers. To add to all this, several banks were established, and reorganized irrigation districts began borrowing money to make improvements. Since many Japanese soldiers had died of disease, improving the island's sanitation and disease environment was also a top priority, and that was done to perfection. One of the resulting effects of this was that the population size grew quickly because the death rates due to failing health systems had fallen. It is no exaggeration to say that in this period, Taiwan became a bustling hub of glory, second only to Japan itself in the region. This was further cemented by the fact that growth in Taiwan's per capita economic product during this colonial period roughly kept up with that of Japan. 
the native Taiwanese population's per capita consumption grew about 1% per year, slower than the growth in consumption in Japan, but greater than the growth in China. Better property rights enforcement, population growth, transportation improvements, and protected agricultural markets caused the value of land to increase quickly, but real wage rates increased little. Most Taiwanese farmers did own some land, but since the poor were more dependent on wages, income inequality increased. It wasn't all rosy, though. Remember, Taiwan was a colony, so ultimately Japan ran the show. And in running the show over their colony, Japan could be, well, rough. At what was their first crack at colonialism, Japanese policymakers put in place harsh punishment to enforce the law. They basically made sure everyone knew who was running the show, and that the show would run smoothly. Perhaps what is critical to note in Japan's time ruling over Taiwan is the dilemma of colony versus territory. This will come back to play a big role in the future, so let's look at it. Japan struggled over whether to make Taiwan a part of Japan or to allow it to be administratively separate and to some degree self-governing. If they had made Taiwan a part of Japan, things would be very different in the modern age. Global geopolitics would be an entirely different animal. As for whether that would be better or for worse is something that's up for debate. However, the Japanese ultimately didn't assimilate Taiwan. All they did was to force the Japanese language, culture, and heritage on the people. At that point, it felt oppressive, but certain advantages came out of this. For example, it gave them access to science and technology that the Japanese had and a better educational system. These were seeds for economic progress that was to be continued later. Taiwan would go on to also become militarily sound, as during the Second Sino-Japanese War, Taiwan and Japan built several military bases on the island and used them as a base of attack. Eventually, however, Japan lost Taiwan after the Second World War, and the island was rid of the Japanese invaders. Though the Taiwanese people had largely fought together with the Japanese, the island was not entirely devastated post-war as Japan was. The recovery period from the war, however, was slow, and the economy of Taiwan, though not in shambles, was definitely not what it was pre-war. Around this time, things got interesting. In mainland China, war had been raging as the civil war between the nationalists and communists ravaged China. However, as they steadily lost ground to the communist forces of Mao Zedong, Chinese nationalist leaders departed for the island of Taiwan, where they established their new capital. This action marked the beginning of the Two China scenario that left mainland China under communist control and made global politics to this very day a complicated game. The moving of the nationalist encampment to Taiwan, though ending direct military conflict between the two parties in China, marked the beginning of a new age, a new age for China. The years following that were hard as Taiwan was experiencing hyperinflation, amongst other things. The island was still also heavily dependent on foreign aid, something which American gladly provided as the world's big brother. But problems in the economy were easy to see and direct to see. On one hand, Taiwan's agricultural economy was left in shambles by the events of the 1940s. What used to be the backbone of the economy was now devastated with Taiwan now struggling big time. Remember earlier when we said that Japan boosted Taiwan's agricultural markets by making all their goods duty free? Well, with Japan out of the picture, all those perks went away. Taiwan lost its protected Japanese markets, and the low interest rate formal sector loans to which even tenant farmers had access in the 1930s were no longer available. It was a bad time, and America stepped in to help. With American help, the government implemented a land reform program in a bid to turn the economy around. This program brought some crucial much needed changes. Firstly, it sold public land to tenant farmers in a bid to empower them. Secondly, it limited rent to 37.5% of the expected harvest and severely restricted the size of individual land holdings, forcing landlords to sell most of their land to the government in exchange for stocks and bonds valued at 2.5 times the land's annual expected harvest. This land was then redistributed. The land reform increased equality among the farm population and strengthened government control of the countryside. Its justice and effect on agricultural investment and productivity are still hotly debated, but at the time, the effects were transparent. As Taiwan began to get new wind under its sails, industrialization started to take place. By the last few years of the 1950s, Taiwan had become known for its cheap manufactured exports. These were cheap particularly because they were produced by small enterprises bound together by flexible subcontracting networks. It was the breaking of a new age for Taiwan, as its exports finally became competent on the world stage. This industrialization of Taiwan can mainly be attributed to three crucial factors. These were A. The decline in land per capita, B. The change in export markets, and lastly, C. Government policy. 
You see, between 1940 and 1962, Taiwan's population increased at an annual rate of slightly over 3%. This cut the amount of land per capita in half. Taiwan's agricultural exports have been sold tariff-free at higher than the world market prices in pre-war Japan, while Taiwan's only important pre-war manufactured exports, imitation Panama hats, faced a 25% tariff in the U.S., their primary market. After the war, agricultural products generally faced the greatest trade barriers. As for government policy, Taiwan ran through a period of an import substitution policy in the 1950s, followed by the promotion of manufactured exports in the 1960s and 1970s. Subsidies were available for certain manufacturers under both regimes. During the import substitution regime, domestic manufacturers were protected both by tariffs and multiple overvalued exchange rates. Under the later export promotion regime, export processing zones were set up in which privileges were extended to businesses that produced products that would not be sold domestically. All this sounds hectic, but it ushered in something glorious. This period in Taiwan's history has now come to be known globally as the Taiwan Miracle. In a nutshell, the Taiwan Miracle was a period in the late 20th century when Taiwan's economy experienced an unprecedented growth rate, with the country also witnessing rapid industrialization. Taiwan's gross national product recorded an explosive growth of a staggering 360% from 1965 to 1986. Imagine that! Even more impressive was the country's global industrial production output, which grew by 680% in the 1965 to 1986 period. Collectively, the Taiwanese miracle can be attributed to government policy and reform. The government made the business environment flexible, allowing domestic companies to quickly adapt to changes in the international market, in a special brand of capitalism, where the government completely protected the market. The Taiwanese government also focused on importing the latest industrial technologies from foreign countries, an act which accelerated the development of the country. The enabling business environment and political goodwill from the government to support businesses triggered a mass exodus of businesses and firms from mainland China who settled in Taiwan. The movement of businesses also brought with it Chinese business elites and intellectuals to the island which further aided the development of the land. The country had a mostly uneducated and undereducated population, which was also quite young and this population offered cheap labor to the domestic companies. Cheap labor meant that Taiwan-based companies had low production costs, resulting in high profits. I mean, who doesn't like cheap labor? There is a dark side to that, but that's a story for another day. As we said a few minutes ago, the United States also played an essential role in the growth of Taiwan during this period and sent to the island nation financial aid amounting to $4 billion dollars between 1945 and 1965, Look, we know you can't send us $4 billion in assistance, but please don't forget to drop a like and maybe comment on the video. Maybe we can have our own Business Basics Miracle of 2023. American assistance to Taiwan during this period also came in the form of military and food aid. In education, the country aimed to have its citizens fluent in English, Mandarin, and Taiwanese. Mandarin was seen as necessary since it was the official language in mainland China, while English was selected as the country embraced globalization. Primary education, in which 70% of Taiwanese children had participated under the Japanese, became universal, and students in higher education increased many-fold. Yes, quite the growth and quite the period of improvement for Taiwan. That period ushered it into the modern age of technology and innovation, something Taiwan completely blew out of the park. At present, the super-developed technology and manufacturing sectors in Taiwan's diversified economy are part of what places the island state among the richest countries in Asia. In fact, Taiwan is known as one of the four Asian tigers for its high-growth economy. The four Asian tigers are the high-growth economies of Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan. Fueled by exports and rapid industrialization, the four Asian tigers have consistently maintained high levels of economic growth since the 1960s and have collectively joined the ranks of the world's wealthiest nations. Hong Kong and Singapore are among the most prominent worldwide financial centers, while South Korea and Taiwan are essential hubs for the global manufacturing of automobiles and electronic components, as well as information technology. Speaking of information technology, it's impossible to talk about just how much of a powerhouse Taiwan is now without mentioning that this is one sector that they completely dominated the world in with their semiconductors. We have made a video on this before when we spoke of America punishing China, but there are still a lot of elements we never touched on regarding Taiwan, so let's get into it. As you probably already know, semiconductors are crucial to the technology that powers the modern world. 
For decades, Taiwan has stood as the world's leading manufacturer of semiconductor chips. Let's dive deeper into the Taiwanese semiconductor manufacturing industry and examine just how and why it has become indispensable to the world. Most of the microchips that we use come from Taiwan or at least go through a process in Taiwan. This has become a huge prop for the economy and will remain that way for decades to come. Most of that comes from one route, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, the world's largest and most valuable semiconductor manufacturer. The Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, more popularly known as the TSMC, is one of the 12 largest companies in the world. At present, it has a market cap of $482.85 billion, but plainly, it's just an economic powerhouse. TSMC was founded by Morris Chang, a Taiwanese-American in 1987, capitalizing off the Taiwanese miracle to try and cement something long-lasting. Morris Chang began a move that now has him referred to by most as the father of semiconductors. During the Taiwanese miracle, a lot of Western companies were outsourcing their manufacturing needs to Asia, and so Chang relocated to Taiwan to capitalize on that prime golden opportunity. After setting everything up, TSMC opened its first fully-owned semiconductor fabrication foundry in 1990. This was followed up by the opening of Taiwan's first 8-inch semiconductor fabrication foundry in 1993. The company then proceeded to open a U.S. fab foundry in 1997 and was able to reach a 1 million wafer capacity. Because of its rapid growth and financial excellence, TMSC became the first Taiwanese firm to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange. TMSC has been growing at a rapid pace, and all this has served to bless Taiwan's economy. The company has pioneered 7 nanometer and 5 nanometer production processes for semiconductor manufacturing and was the first firm to use extreme ultraviolet lithography in semiconductor fabrication processes. The company has grown so large that it has the estimated global capacity to produce 13 million 300 millimeter equivalent wafers per year. If you don't understand what that means, let us just say this. That's a huge number. TSMC now has subsidiaries in China, the United States, Singapore, and offices in China, Europe, India, Japan, South Korea, and even the United States. You get what we're putting across. The company has now grown super huge, and with it, a good portion of Taiwan's economy. In the sector of semiconductors, not even China can hold a candle to Taiwan now. The company single-handedly accounts for 55.5% of the global semiconductor market share. On top of TSMC, Taiwan also has several other companies like ASC Technology, AU Optronics, MediaTrek, Lighton Technology, and United Microelectronics. These are all $5 billion plus companies that add to the benefit of Taiwan's economy. Year by year, these companies widen the margin between Taiwan and China, making Taiwan an unstoppable force not only in the region, but in the world. Pound for pound, Taiwan's already richer than China. An easy metric that brings us to this conclusion is GDP per capita, a universal measurement. GDP per capita is a popular metric for the average prosperity and well-being of a country. Unlike some other measures of economic productivity, it takes population size into account, allowing easy comparisons between countries with different sizes. That is why, when we take into consideration economy sizes, GTPs, population sizes, and wealth distribution, per capita income is a more accurate measure of a nation's economic progress. You see, even if a nation may have a high GDP and large population, its residents may not necessarily have high standards of living. This is the case that we see in a lot of countries, including China itself. Using this, we can very clearly and in an unbiased way state that Taiwan is far richer than China. In fact, as of 2022, China's GDP per capita was approximately $12,814. Taiwan's, on the other hand, was almost three times as much at $32,756. That makes Taiwan one of the richest Asian countries far outpacing China so far as GDP per capita is concerned. Don't shoot the messenger, the numbers say so. However, with just GDP in consideration, China takes the cake. As Taiwan's economy grows and the country becomes richer, the more they become less reliant on China, because of the diplomatic problems between Taiwan and China, Taiwan is slowly making its break from China and its markets. As Taiwan grows in economic strength to someday soon rival China, it is pretty much breaking any big brother, little brother bond. So what are these signs that China and Taiwan are starting to sever bonds? Call it a decoupling as you will. Well, according to Taiwan's investment commission, Taiwanese realized investment in China has plummeted from $9 billion in 2017 to just $1.7 billion in 2022. 
What this simply means is that China's investment in Taiwan has steadily reduced at the same time when other countries' investment in Taiwan has increased. China is now far eclipsed by nations like the US and Netherlands, who have built closer relations with the island nation. Using completed statistics from 2022, you can see that the officially recorded investment data shows that China accounted for 34% of Taiwanese firms worldwide investment in 2022, followed by 31% of Southeast Asia and India, and 13% of the US and Europe. This is in sharp contrast to a decade ago, when China accounted for over two-thirds of Taiwan's global outward investment. Again, all this reiterates the simple point that Taiwan and China are not growing economically at a consistent rate as was done in the past. What could be causing this problem or situation? Well, according to Taiwan's official survey report in 2022, it was explained that the growing competition from local producers, rising labor costs, and difficulty in developing China's domestic market are the main obstacles for Taiwanese firms doing business in China. Of course, these factors do not exist in a vacuum, and in tandem with other external factors, they all come together to contribute to the decoupling between the two nations. The data also tells us that Taiwan's investors are paying less attention to China and thereby focusing inward. Looking at the 2018 to 2019 pre-pandemic data shows us that Taiwanese investment in China fell by over 50% in that period alone. The timing strongly indicates that changing US trade policies toward China played a significant role in the matter. If you don't remember, that period went something like this. I'm going to take you straight to the White House, the President of the United States, announcing new trade tariffs against China. 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 Trade tensions are flaring up between the U.S. and China. Trump announcing plans to increase tariffs on billions of dollars worth of Chinese goods. I happen to think that tariffs for our country are very powerful. You know, we're the piggy bank that everybody steals from. Just to recap, between July 2018 and May 2019, Washington delivered four rounds of higher tariffs on Chinese goods. This was because of the political dynamics that were taking place between the two administrations. In a bid to not get caught in the crossfire that threatened to hurt them with friendly fire, China-based Taiwanese firms, especially those in the information and communication technology industry, shifted some production and export capacity from China to Taiwan and other developing countries, notably Vietnam. Looking at data from the U.S. International Trade Administration shows us that American imports of computers and electronic products from Taiwan and Vietnam doubled from 2019 to 2022, whereas imports of the same products from China increased by only 10% during that period. Taiwanese firms also largely echoed President Trump's push to invest in the American manufacturing industry. In 2020, their investments in the U.S. rose by 650% to $4.2 billion. The investments continued to grow, amounting to $11 billion in 2022, and making the U.S. Taiwan's third largest outward investment destination after China and Singapore, according to Taiwan's Investment Commission. So as we said before, as Taiwan decouples from China, it moves that much closer to its other allies and directs its efforts inward as well. This has been beneficial to Taiwan, making it much richer. The train of soiled U.S. slash China diplomatic relations has continued thematically, and Taiwan always stands as the first to benefit. Taiwan is so valued by its allies, particularly the U.S., that we have had incidents where U.S. diplomats risk the wrath of China in the backing of Taiwan. Case in point, this. The Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, is in Taiwan. The most senior U.S. politician to visit Taiwan in 25 years, Nancy Pelosi, has said America will never abandon the island during a trip that's been condemned as a major provocation by China. China is accusing the U.S. of playing with fire. The meeting China did not want to happen. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi defying Beijing's stern warnings. A torrent of Chinese aircraft, missiles and ships moved towards Taiwan as soon as House Speaker Nancy Pelosi left the island. While certain things like the U.S. sanctions on exporting advanced semiconductor chips and equipment to China were a bit of a blow to Taiwanese companies' exports, the island nation's Ministry of Finance has had some interesting news. The figures show that the growth rate of Taiwanese exports of electronic products, including semiconductor chips to China and Hong Kong, has decelerated from 24% in 2020 and 2021 to 11% in 2022, but the growth rates of Taiwan's exports of electronic products to Southeast Asia and India accelerated greatly by 21% and 72% respectively. Quite the compensatory leap! On top of its own direct influence, Taiwan's growth has also had an indirect influence on China's economy. Take this situation for example. Taiwan's export of semiconductor chips to India for the final assembly could grow further after Apple decided to shift iPhone production to India. 
Apple is a main contributor to Taiwan's exports of semiconductor chips to assemble devices in a third country, and India is expected to account for 50% of iPhone production by 2027, up from 5% at present. That will increase the market for Taiwan and make the country even richer and more solid. But this market is not being created out of thin air, it's being taken from somewhere. Where exactly? Well, China. China's exports will suffer from the loss of its global factory status, and they will suffer a lot. Chinese firms have a particularly strong reliance on importing Taiwanese semiconductor chips, and that will make them vulnerable during the decoupling of the cross-strait production network, with China's domestic economy suffering from a stagnant real estate market and weak private consumption, dwindling exports will only add hail to the snowstorm. This reduction in economic activity at the same time that Taiwan is soaring shows the reason why day by day, Taiwan is claiming the wealth thrown from China. It also seems that somehow, the decoupling from China isn't affecting Taiwan adversely, despite it doing the same to China. Taiwan's overall trade posted positive growth in 2022, while China's exports and imports declined by 10% and 8% respectively. One of the likely outcomes that have been thought to occur from this decoupling is the fact that China might want to retaliate against Taiwan. One of the ways they could likely do this is through the termination of the Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement. This Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement is a free trade agreement between the governments of the People's Republic of China and Taiwan that aims to reduce tariffs and commercial barriers between the two sides, as well as improve cross-strait relations. However, Taiwan's merchandise exports to China, which benefited from the lower tariffs in ECFA, accounted for only 5% of Taiwan's total exports. As such, the impact of ending ECFA on Taiwan's economy might be restrained. That's a nice way of us saying it really wouldn't be as effective as hoped for. Another method of retaliation unique to China in this case is, well, war. You know we can't entirely conclude the Taiwan slash China discussion without talking about, well, war. There is a small chance that China can just try to annex Taiwan, as it already claims that it's part of its territory. We went over this earlier, we're sure you remember. China's President Xi Jinping has even publicly stated that Taiwan should be under no illusion of independence. His exact words this year were, We should actively oppose the external forces and secessionist activities of Taiwan independence. We should unswervingly advance the cause of national rejuvenation and reunification. As much as China hasn't launched an attack on Taiwan, it would be ignorant to ignore China's provocations for several reasons. China has long since been known to be unpredictable and to assume President Xi Jinping's actions is a mistake. As Taiwan keeps growing in wealth and power, it's not unfathomable to think that China would want access to the famous semiconductor technology from its renegade province. However, if China invaded Taiwan and TSMC were destroyed, Beijing would face a situation which it had no significant access to EUV technology, no ability to mass-produce leading-edge semiconductors and crippling economic sanctions that would cut it off from much of the global economy. It would be a catastrophic situation on all sides. All that said, the actual risk of imminent Chinese military action against Taiwan remains low. Beijing always flexes military muscle when the highest level US and Taiwanese officials meet face to face as it did with Speaker Pelosi's visit and then Speaker McCarthy's visit to Taiwan. It is much more likely that this stance between Taiwan and China will keep taking place in the shadows. And in the meantime, Taiwan's wealth is only set to grow. Back to the question. Why is Taiwan becoming richer at a faster pace than China? Well, at least when it comes to GDP per capita. A part of the reason is the fact that China is very corrupt and that erodes national wealth and destabilizes economic structure. Taiwan is corrupt too, as is every country on earth, but where the corruption perceptions index for the public sector showed 32 points in Taiwan for 2022, China's rating is far worse. China's point score was 55 points. Just for clarity, how the corruption perceptions index works is, the higher the figure, the worse the rate of corruption. So yes, China's rate of corruption is almost 172% worse than Taiwan's. Corruption has eroded China's economy, and it continues to drag the country behind. Don't just think of over-the-counter corruption either. We're talking about corruption that can impose economic damages both directly, such as in cases of tax evasion, money laundering, and other illicit activities, and indirectly by distorting market mechanisms, increasing the cost of business, and discouraging competition. For you to understand this thoroughly, realize that in a 2018 report, the United Nations suggested that corruption across the world costs at least $2.6 trillion, or 5% of the global GDP. The same report also noted that businesses pay more than $1 trillion in bribes every year. You don't need us to tell you how substantial those figures are. 
For China, one calculation from 2001 pegged the cost of corruption at 14.5% to 14.9% of China's GDP between 1999 and 2001. A more recent estimate from 2010 put the financial cost of corruption for China at 10% of its GDP. That means a tenth of China's annual money is lost in bribes. Yikes. It's no wonder that bribery imposes significant challenges for China. Official government figures show that of the officials arrested in 2018 for corruption, 17 people received bribes of at least $1.47 million and five have taken bribes of $14.7 million or more. In one instance, the vice chairman of the Habai People's Congress, Yang Chongyong, was found guilty of accepting bribes totaling roughly $30 million in September 2018 and sentenced to life in prison. The corruption and bribery don't just happen at the top level only. No, it's across the board. Bribes have also been shown to find their way into the hands of tax collectors, which has made eliminating tax evasion a challenge for Beijing. According to the World Institute for Development Economics Research, tax evasion costs China $66.8 billion annually. To help root out evaders, China implemented the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development Common Reporting Standard that provides Beijing with information on assets stored overseas. It's a good measure, but it's not quite as effective. There's more, though. China has also begun targeting the entertainment industry, where fake contracts have been used to evade taxes. In a recent high-profile case, Chinese actress Fan Bingbing and her companies received fines of $127 million in back taxes and penalties. All this is not something that goes unnoticed either. Chinese citizens have consistently ranked corruption among their top concerns in various surveys. The 2013 China General Social Survey, for instance, stated that over 71% of respondents felt corruption was extremely serious or very serious. A 2016 Pew Research Center survey noted that 49% of respondents reported that corrupt officials are a very big problem, significantly higher than other concerns, such as the country's wealth gap and crime. Results from earlier Pew studies show that this concern is persistent, with 50% of respondents in 2012 reporting that corruption is a very big problem. Of course, this is not to say that once you eliminate corruption, China's economy will boom exponentially. No. No one factor can exist in a vacuum. But it is important to note that when you compare the reasons Taiwan is progressing more and less corruption on the island is a contributing factor. So, at the end of the day, where are we with this? Well, for starters, China's meteoric rise that has seen it become this rich is very similar to the Taiwan miracle that occurred more than four decades ago. In actuality, those two events that have produced two giants share numerous characteristics. What China has now, factors like the availability of cheap labor among its population, political goodwill from a stable government, and the non-existence of trade unions, mirror factors that were behind the Taiwan miracle of the late 20th century. As much as Taiwan is wealthy and is still rising, it's hard to say that Taiwan as a nation is richer than China or that its economy is more powerful. No, China's economy is simply too large for comparison. Today, China's share of global GDP stands at over 18% when adjusted for price differences, the largest of any country. In a way, the rise of China has overshadowed the economic growth of Taiwan, which, like many countries, cannot compete against China in labor-intensive industries due to the diminishing availability of a cheap, educated labor market in Taiwan. Taiwan, however, has found a solution, one created by finding its own niche, information technology. Taiwan, as we have been mentioning, has been investing into this sector heavily. As a result, Taiwan has become a major IT hub in the region, with the presence of Taiwanese technology being felt as far as an American Silicon Valley. In time, Taiwan could rise to the level of China. That time, however, is not now. The chances are there, though, but some things need to be done for Taiwan's success story to be complete. For starters, Taiwan must continue to increase its margin in the semiconductor industry to solidify its position in the global economy. On top of this, Taiwan must diversify its economy so that it has a lot of sectors that are thriving and so that the economy cannot be drastically shaken by inconsistencies in any one sector. With the aid of trade partners like the US, Taiwan can grow beyond reason and limitations. Taiwan must also become more fully integrated into the international community, including joining the WHO to prepare for the next pandemic and becoming part of the comprehensive and progressive agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership to prepare for changes in the global supply chain. Taiwan's path towards a sustainable economic future depends not only on a capable government, a hardworking population, and a more global outlook, but also on the support of the international community. Taiwan cannot resist the gravitational pull of the Chinese economy unless like-minded democracies, which may all eventually face their own versions of Taiwan's China dilemma. 
As for how Taiwan will continue to develop relative to China, who knows? We suppose, as with all things, time will tell. In human history, some new technologies have changed everything. Historians call them technological revolutions. The Industrial Revolution was one of them, and it changed the entire world. Economics, warfare, and the entire society were transformed. But right now, we're living through another technological revolution. You guessed it, artificial intelligence. With the launch of ChatGPT, the potential of AI can't be ignored anymore. Suddenly, AI can answer basically any question you ask it. The new technology is rapidly making its way into the biggest companies in the world, such as Google, Apple, or Microsoft. They are investing a lot into artificial intelligence because it has a huge potential. Goldman Sachs predicts that investment into AI could reach $200 billion in 2025, but even this huge figure could be a conservative estimate. Over the past decade, Google has already invested an estimated $200 billion into artificial intelligence. In the span of six months, $40 billion of venture capital has been invested into the technology. And no wonder, artificial intelligence can make businesses a lot of money. In a few years, computers will be able to replace a lot of jobs that were once done by expensive employees. This is concerning for a lot of people because it could lead to mass job losses. But on a political level, this isn't the only thing to be concerned about. While the technology could be very disruptive at home, it could also be very disruptive internationally. We're talking about the US and China situation here. You see, artificial intelligence basically has an infinite number of applications. It can and will be used by businesses to make money, but it can also be used for military purposes. This includes things like cyber warfare, military command and control, and automated weapons. In the not too distant future, the country with the best AI will have an edge over other countries militarily. There are two countries who would love to have this, the United States and China. If you want to achieve superiority as a country, having advanced artificial intelligence will be a must. Both the United States and China are obviously very interested in this military superiority thing. In various national security documents, this shared interest in AI has been openly talked about. There's even talk of an artificial intelligence arms race between the two powers. But obviously, there could only be one winner in this AI race. This country will be the one who gets the best technology the fastest. In this video, we'll go over how this race is taking place and how it will change the world we live in. Now, artificial intelligence is based on complex algorithms. We don't understand them fully, but there's one algorithm that we do know about, the YouTube algorithm. Without your support, this video won't get too far on YouTube. We put a lot of effort in these videos, so your likes are greatly appreciated. If you want to see more of these videos, consider subscribing. Thanks. We need to speed up building China into a strong country with advanced manufacturing. Age of AI, data is the new oil, so China is the new Saudi Arabia. Artificial intelligence has been a crucial tool for many nations' militaries for years. Artificial intelligence on the battlefield carries great potential, but also higher risk. Made in China 2025 plan, it aims to create a next generation artificial intelligence development plan. The United States and China are without a doubt the leaders in the AI space. Other countries like Canada, Japan, or South Korea have been trying to develop their own AI systems. But all the notable AI developments today are located either in the United States or China. The major technology firms like Google, Apple, or Microsoft are all American, as the US is still the world leader when it comes to digital technology. It's likely that Silicon Valley will continue to be a big player in the technology field for years to come. But China isn't too far behind, with state-led initiatives trying to push China's AI industry forward. The CCP has announced its goal of achieving global AI leadership by 2030. In China, the government has a lot of power over its companies because of the communist aspects of the CCP. Xi Jinping can set goals for his domestic AI industry, and 10 companies like Weibo or Tencent simply have to follow. With all the plans Xi Jinping is making, it's clear that China is trying to become a global AI superpower, but the United States isn't happy with what Xi Jinping is trying to achieve. The CCP's artificial intelligence could be a threat to the United States, especially when it surpasses American capabilities. AI will be a vital asset to have in the future because it can be applied in so many ways. On the business side, the country with the best AI systems will have an economic benefit. It will have the most competitive, most innovative, and most productive economy in the world. This is because AI provides an economy with, well, intelligence for a very low price. Intelligence will turn into a kind of resource that countries can use to produce goods and services. It's kind of like electricity in some ways, because that was also once a brand new and life-changing resource. And it will have just as much economic value. Artificial intelligence is expected to add $15 trillion 
to the global economy by 2030. Just to point out how insane that is, that equals to about 56% of the current US GDP. AI will change the global economy, and the country with the best AI systems will be able to grow tremendously from it. This is something that China or the United States obviously aim for. They want to secure their AI resources because they could be just as important as energy resources in the future. But AI isn't only important in an economic sense, but also in a military sense. A lot of the military operations require human intelligence, whether it be logistics, research and development, or military strategy and planning. Humans always had to use their own intelligence. But in the future, artificial intelligence will be able to take over some of these demanding tasks. AI will simply be superior to human intelligence in a lot of ways. Just in the sheer computing power alone, artificial intelligence will easily beat humans, and there's no doubt that artificial intelligence can help with logistics, research, and development or military strategy and planning. On the logistics side, AI has a lot of potential. It could say which ammunition should move where at what time. It could manage supply chains and identify supply chain weaknesses. It could plan routes and optimize military transportation. These are just some of the advantages AI can offer in logistics. Military logistics are mind-bogglingly complex, and a lot of human labor is needed to make it work. In modern warfare, it takes more people to prepare and supply an army than there are in the army itself. The so-called tooth-to-nail ratio says how many military personnel are needed to support each soldier. In the Iraq War, this ratio was about 8 to 1, with only 11% of US personnel actually fighting with boots on the ground. The rest of personnel, a whopping 89%, was involved in things like logistics and planning. If AI can make military logistics and planning more efficient, there will be less of a need for personnel behind the scenes. As a result, the entire military operation will be dramatically more efficient, and with research and development, it'll be just the same. AI has already proven itself in the research and development field multiple times. For example, scientists have been able to discover a new antibiotic with the help of AI computer systems. If AI can already understand molecular chemistry, it's probably able to understand military engineering too. In the future, artificial intelligence may be able to help design rockets, drones, fighter jets, and much more. This is all hypothetical, of course, as we don't know the limitations of AI yet. But AI has already been used for designing chemical weapons. Researchers have designed 40,000 lethal molecules in just six hours with the help of artificial intelligence. So the country with the best artificial intelligence may have a military advantage. An AI-supported military may be able to design the best weapons, and the possibilities of AI don't end here. Artificial intelligence may also be able to help with devising military strategies. Military strategies are incredibly complex and incredibly important. To quote Sun Tzu, every battle is won before it is fought. To win a war, military planners need to assess risks and deal with unknown variables, which is very hard to do. But artificial intelligence may be able to do a good job because of its sheer computing power. Assessing risks and dealing with unknown variables is nothing for an advanced AI. Now, it's very unlikely that AI will make strategic decisions entirely on its own. AI can't fully automate strategic decision making yet. According to business strategists, in its current development stage, AI is not smart enough to make complex strategic decisions, but AI can already be used for the building blocks of strategy, like data analysis. For example, computer vision can be applied. With AI, computers can analyze images and videos to derive meaningful information. Military strategists can use this to analyze satellite imagery and detect enemy forces. Even with today's technology, AI can help military strategists a lot with gathering intelligence. Therefore, the country that integrates AI the best could have a more effective military strategy. And this is not to mention the in-combat applications of AI. During wartime, a military needs to be flexible and make fast decisions on how to act. Artificial intelligence is not only able to deal with complex problems, but it can also decide things in a matter of seconds. AI systems can simply process more information than a human and faster. When an AI-supported military is attacked, it'll be able to counterattack in no time because of computer guidance. And on the battlefield itself, AI will also be able to do some interesting stuff. Perhaps the biggest in-combat applications are autonomous vehicles and drones. The United States has already tested a fully autonomous F-16 fighter jet entirely controlled by AI. Things like tanks or warships could follow soon. Ethan Lethal Autonomous Weapons Systems, also known as killer robots, aren't entirely out of the picture. 
The definition of a lethal autonomous weapon is that it can independently search for and engage a target. Allegedly, such weapons have already been used in the Ukraine war in the form of drones. Some drones have the capability to independently find and attack enemy forces without human oversight. Whether this form of warfare will be banned is the question, because the United Nations is split on how it could be regulated. Therefore, it's likely that autonomous vehicles and weapons will revolutionize combat. It's crucially important for militaries to implement AI this way, because non-autonomous systems will get outdated. Apart from this lethal application, artificial intelligence can also provide situational awareness on the battlefield. In the military, information about the environment can decide who wins the battle. The United States is already developing and testing AI tools, which can support the military with all domain situational awareness. These systems can pull together massive amounts of data to provide commanders with a clear picture of the battlefield. This can speed up and improve decision making. Implementing AI in this way can give a military an advantage, because this sort of information decides wars. Another military application of AI that has to be mentioned is the one in cyberspace. In the online era, cyberspace has become an integral part of national security. Almost every aspect of society is linked with the internet, whether it be the financial system, public infrastructure, or national defense. It is becoming more and more important to protect these systems against cyber attacks, because the threat to national security is real. For example, North Korea is very active in the cyberspace, conducting multiple cyber attacks. North Korean hackers once stole close to $1 billion from the National Bank in Bangladesh. Actors like North Korea like cyber attacks, because they can be pulled off remotely, but they still are very potent. And guess what? Artificial intelligence can help with these cyber attacks. The new developments in AI are already used by hackers to generate malware. As AI gets more advanced, the potential cyber attacks from its users will only get more dangerous. So the country with the best AI can deliver the most deadly cyber attacks. However, AI is a double-edged sword. It can also be used to detect weaknesses in your own digital systems and defend against them. It's likely that the country with the best AI will also have the best defended cyberspace. In future warfare, cyber attacks will play a huge role, and AI could decide which country wins the cyber war. When it comes to overall military applications, the importance of AI cannot be understated. What we just discussed is only the tip of the iceberg. When it gets implemented in the military, AI will change the nature of warfare. Going back to the United States and China, it's obvious why these countries are so interested in this technology. They're two powerful nations with opposite strategic interests, which is why they want to have a strong military. It's inevitable that AI will get used by them, because otherwise, their enemy will do so and be vastly superior. The country who can rapidly and effectively integrate AI into its military will gain a significant advantage. So let's dive deeper into the strategies of the United States and China to win this AI race. Use of artificial intelligence on the battlefield is both a major and potentially scary goal. Amazon, Google, and other mega corporations have used them to build vast commercial empires. Baidu claimed that its chatbot, Ernie, is beating ChatGPT. You can see these companies come up and become very powerful. China is deploying robotic weapons along the border with India. The country that is able to most rapidly and effectively integrate new technology into warfighting wins. On July 20th, 2017, Chinese authorities published this document. This multi-page long statement is the blueprint for China's AI dominance by 2030. The CCP has divided its goal for 2030 into three smaller steps. In 2020, China's AI competitiveness should have entered the first echelon internationally. The blueprint said that some of the world's leading AI companies should be Chinese by now. Within the government, the CCP should have gathered high-level personnel and innovation teams to help form AI policy, it's hard to judge if the CCP achieved these goals already, but China has certainly advanced in the AI field. Chinese AI researchers now publish more papers and secure more patents than their American counterparts. This doesn't mean China is necessarily ahead of the US, but it is certainly competitive. When it comes to AI companies, China has secured a second place internationally. Chinese companies aren't at the same level as Silicon Valley, but firms like Baidu or Alibaba are certainly close followers. Baidu, basically China's Google, has made its own AI-powered chatbot. With the first step completed, the CCP's second bundle of goals are set for 2025. By 2025, AI should be the driving force of industrial upgrading and economic transformation. In China, the government is responsible for making economic progress instead of the free market. And currently, the CCP is betting on AI. 
They want it to become the main source for national growth by 2025. One of the reasons why the CCP is looking at artificial intelligence is to escape the middle income trap. Manufacturing simple goods, like plastics for example, can provide lower income countries with an opportunity. But once an economy has grown to a middle income level, it gets tricky. The initial low value industries aren't sufficient for economic growth anymore. To go from a middle income nation to a high income one, countries need industries that provide a lot of value. China is one of these countries. China has been able to grow tremendously from low value adding industries, such as low end manufacturing. But in order to continue growing, China needs to find high value adding industries. Right now, the CCP struggles with this. But with the rise of the AI industry, this problem might get fixed. As mentioned earlier, the AI industry is projected to be at least $15 trillion by 2030. If China manages to get a significant market share on this industry, the country can escape the middle income trap. That's why by 2025, China wants to have a global high value AI industry. To complete the final stage of the plan in 2030, China should become the leading AI innovation center. According to the document, China will occupy the commanding heights of AI technology. It also says that AI will become a core technology for key systems in all aspects of applications. One of these key systems is national defense, or the People's Liberation Army. If China manages to achieve this by 2030, it'll be no small feat. The Chinese government wants to get it done through utilizing its centralized authority. According to the blueprint, the CCP will fully give play to the advantages of the socialist system to concentrate forces. This means that the CCP will try to get everyone in China on board to make advanced AI systems. The quote-unquote private Chinese businesses are pushed by the CCP to rapidly create the technology. This includes huge tech firms like Huawei, Tencent, or ByteDance. Now, it's not that these companies are directly controlled by the CCP, but in the majority of Chinese private companies, the CCP has a lot of influence. In a 2019 study, 92% of China's top 500 companies had CCP bodies within their corporate structure. This means that the lines dividing government and corporate policies are blurry to say the least. In order to achieve the CCP's agenda of AI dominance, private companies are going to help the government. And this concept is not new either. In order to make the social credit system, the CCP has used companies before. For example, the company SenseTime has made parts of the facial recognition system used by the CCP. You know, the cameras that scan the citizens in all major Chinese cities. Unsurprisingly, the CCP was a major investor in SenseTime. For many future AI developments, the Chinese government will go to the same corporate route. An example of this are the major research labs that have opened up in Beijing's Zhongguanakun district, dubbed China's own Silicon Valley. Tons of companies, both domestic and foreign, are trying to develop new AI technologies there. This includes Chinese tech giants Baidu and ByteDance, but also American companies like Intel or Microsoft. Microsoft Research Asia, based in China, is Microsoft's largest research institute outside of the United States. Chinese authorities have incentivized this because of the R&D tax incentives. Companies in China are allowed a pre-tax deduction of R&D expenses, which allows them to deduct 200% of their R&D expenses from their taxable income. This makes doing AI research in China very attractive for corporations, which indirectly helps the CCP's AI agenda. Another clear strategy of the CCP is to create AI-related talent at home. In 2018, the Ministry of Education in China mandated high schools to implement AI into their curriculum. Educating a new generation of data scientists and AI experts is a clear way to get ahead of other countries. And it's much needed too. The demand for these positions in China is way bigger than the supply of educated people. 75% of Chinese business executives have trouble hiring data scientists, and the situation is also dire with other AI-related roles. In fact, China is expected to have a tech talent gap of more than 4 million in the near future. Not that this problem is uniquely Chinese, of course, as the United States is also facing shortages with its tech workforce. But the country who is able to solve this issue will get ahead. In the future, the country with the best tech talent will be able to develop AI faster, and China, with its much bigger population, seems to have an advantage in this area. According to a Georgetown University report, China will have twice as many STEM PhD graduates as the United States by 2025. Many of these STEM PhD graduates will be able to help with creating new AI technology. If the CCP manages to scale its universities and surpass the United States, it can create a bigger talent pool for AI developers. This will obviously benefit companies in China, but also the government. You see, not every new AI system in China will be developed for private companies to scale the economy. 
especially for military applications, the CCP will use AI for its own benefit. The People's Liberation Army spends an estimated 1-2% to of its budget on AI, a significant investment when compared to other countries. For example, the US military only spends an estimated 0.1-0.2% to of its budget on the technology. It seems like Washington is changing course with the Pentagon requesting more funding for AI projects. Some estimate that China is ahead of the US in AI military spending. Others claim that the two are on par. At least it's clear that China is allocating a bigger part of its military budget on the technology. And no wonder. China is trying to match the United States militarily. President Xi Jinping is telling his military to prepare for war, with the situation in Taiwan getting very tense. For years now, he's been calling on his military to achieve world-class standards. In other words, United States matching standards. When he got his third term in office, Xi vowed to make his army a great wall of steel to protect Chinese interests. Now this means that China is competing militarily with the United States. That isn't easy for the CCP, because arguably the United States still has the most powerful military in the world. But Xi Jinping thinks that the People's Liberation Army can match the United States through the use of AI. His Russian colleague Vladimir Putin certainly agrees with this. He has said that whoever becomes the leader in this sphere becomes the ruler of the world. China certainly wants to compete, and it does this through the so-called intelligentization of its army. This became apparent when the Chinese government released a white paper in 2019 called China's National Defense in the New Era. In this document, it was said that international military competition is undergoing historic changes. China's prediction is that intelligent warfare is on the horizon. The concept of intelligent warfare means that wars will be fought with weapons based on artificial intelligence. This document was huge news at the time, because the world's second biggest military claimed that AI would be essential for warfare. The CCP made it clear that it wanted to speed up the development of an intelligent military. According to the White Paper, the broad goal of the Chinese military is to match the US by the middle of the century. Because of China's push towards an intelligent military, it looks like the CCP wants to use artificial intelligence to achieve this. Oftentimes, military revolutions shake up the international order of power. According to PLA officials, there are four main areas where the Chinese military wants to implement AI. First of all, AI will be implemented to control unmanned vehicles and unmanned weapons. This includes things like high-speed combat, drones, submarine drones, and possibly even unmanned ships carrying these drones. Yes, they actually want to make autonomous carriers for autonomous drones. These unmanned vehicles have many applications in warfare, as we've already seen the use of drones in the war in Ukraine. Attacking the enemy with unmanned vehicles is simply more efficient and faster, since they don't have human limitations. They can be used to fight a war of attrition and drain enemy defenses, because there are no human lives involved. The PLA is also developing drones and autonomous vehicles for intelligent military logistics and reconnaissance. It could be very powerful if the PLA could get supplies to the front line automatically, and it would be just as powerful to spy on the enemy with autonomous drones. Some time ago, it seems like science fiction to have AI-operated drones, ships, and other vehicles in warfare, but with the rise of intelligent warfare, this might become reality. The Chinese military certainly thinks it will. The second implementation of AI in warfare is the processing of large amounts of information. With machine learning and artificial intelligence, extremely large data sets can be analyzed and filtered. The PLA wants to use this for military purposes, because the technology can provide crucial information during warfare. Modern wars are very chaotic, with tons of information coming from all different sides. But AI can process this information and provide the military with a clear picture of the battlefield, aka situational awareness. This is not some minor detail. The military who has the best intelligence on the battlefield has a higher chance to win the battle. So implementing AI to process data will win you future wars. Another way the PLA wants to implement AI is the speeding up of military decision making. AI will assist the military's command and control to make complex decisions and make them fast. Some AI models can already help with predicting future scenarios, although you have to be careful with this. If you give the computer the wrong data, it won't be able to make good predictions about a war. It's unlikely that AI will be fully implemented in China's military command because of the risks associated with it. The PLA doesn't want AI to make one miscalculation and start a conflict, for example, but using AI to assist human decision-making will be a key component of intelligent warfare. For example, AI can detect any biases in human decisions. The computer can give an unbiased view based on the data it has collected. This will also speed up decision-making, since the military analysis doesn't have to be done by humans. The fourth implementation of AI in the PLA has less to do with the actual warfare itself. 
With the strategy of cognitive warfare, the PLA is trying to find ways of winning wars without having to fight. Cognitive warfare is influencing the enemy's attitudes and behaviors to gain an advantage. By spreading propaganda or misinformation, the military can influence public opinion at home and abroad. For example, China could try to influence the US public opinion on Taiwan. AI can help with this because it has a good understanding of human psychology and emotions. Psychological operations are already part of US military strategy, so the idea of cognitive warfare isn't completely new. Influencing the enemy's emotions is a very powerful concept in modern warfare. When the enemy doesn't believe it stands a chance, there's a good chance it won't fight anyway. If the PLA can implement AI into cognitive warfare, it could be able to influence the enemy's emotions pretty effectively. Although this application is arguably the vaguest, it's still very potent. From these four main areas of application, it's clear that the CCP wants to integrate AI into its military. In doing so, it's trying to prepare for intelligent warfare, but the CCP really develops the military AI technologies itself. Just like the Pentagon, the CCP often hires contractors to do the work for them. A Politico study suggests that 60% of China's AI purchases come from private companies. Now, private companies in China aren't as private as in the United States, with the widespread CCP involvement. But nevertheless, hiring private companies to do the work is a lot different than developing AI technology independently. The question is, why is the PLA using these private companies? The answer is Xi Jinping's strategy of military-civil fusion, known as MCF. He wants to eliminate the barriers between China's civilian and commercial sectors and its military and defense complex. The president even chairs a development committee, which is responsible for achieving this military-civil fusion goal. The idea has a lot of potential because it basically calls for both the civil and military side to share resources. You know, socialism. When it comes to AI technology, Xi Jinping wants private companies to share developments with the Chinese military. This is exploiting the dual-use nature of AI, because it can be used for both civilian and military purposes. When a commercial company has developed AI for autonomous driving, the CCP could be able to use it for military logistics. So eliminating the barriers between the military and civilian and commercial sectors could give the CCP access to powerful AI technology. And sometimes, the CCP's attempts to obtain AI technology from others are international. The FBI has warned companies of Chinese attempts to steal American AI technology. That's military civil fusion on a global level. The Chinese military doesn't want to develop all the technology on its own. Getting it from the civilian and commercial side is much faster and cheaper. That's why military civil fusion is a key part of China's AI strategy. It allows the CCP to mobilize all of China's assets and technological developments. According to the US government, MCF aims to pave the way for the PRC to be the first country to transition to intelligent warfare. The four main areas of AI implementation will be achieved with this strategy. So, this is how the CCP is preparing its military for next generation conflict. Well, the Pentagon unveiled its plan to increase its use of artificial intelligence. The plan calls for accelerating the use of AI across the military. That'll include warfare. It'll include intelligence gathering. The Pentagon also warned that the U.S. must focus on AI in part because Russia and China are also investing in this type of technology. The Pentagon can't sit idly and do nothing with artificial intelligence. If the United States fails to implement artificial intelligence into its military, it won't be a global superpower anymore. This idea isn't new to the Department of Defense. The Pentagon said that it must adopt AI to maintain its strategic position, prevail on future battlefields, and safeguard this order. So let's look at the Pentagon's plan to adopt AI. Some of the first mentions of a military AI strategy were back in 2018, with a year's version of the National Defense Strategy. It's said that the department will invest broadly in military application of autonomy, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. In June of 2022, the Pentagon released another document called the Responsible Artificial Intelligence Strategy and Implementation Pathway. The strategy puts an emphasis on ethics and safety, which seems like a good idea when creating new military technology. The Department of Defense makes clear that AI needs to be adopted in a responsible way, but even though AI can have unwanted side effects, the risks of not implementing the technology are even bigger. The Pentagon says it cannot maintain its competitive advantage without transforming itself into an AI-ready organization. In a way, the Department of Defense is forced to develop AI technology. Not everyone likes this, as some people are worried about the negative sides of automated warfare. This includes the likes of Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking. They think that AI will be way too dangerous if it's used by militaries, because it can be very lethal. With all the talk about ethics and safety, the Pentagon is trying to take this into account. 
By implementing ethical principles and legal procedures, it hopes the AI won't get out of control. But overall, the strategy is clear. The Department of Defense will develop artificial intelligence no matter what. This is because it doesn't want to not lose against China in a possible confrontation. In its competitive AI strategy, the department identified tons of LOEs, or lines of effort. In fact, there were 64 LOEs in the 2022 document alone. Most of the points have to do with bureaucratic governance, so we won't bore you with the details, but some of the bigger strategies are very interesting for us to understand. In 2018, the Pentagon created the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, JAIC in short. It led the military's AI development by delivering and adopting the technology. In 2020, the center signed an $800 million contract with Booz Allen Hamilton to deliver AI-related services. This is one of the first big steps to adopt AI into the US military. In 2022, however, the JAIC was merged with other Department of Defense bodies to form the Chief Digital and Artificial Intelligence Office. This office, called the CDAO, now leads the military's AI strategy and policy. But it's not like the CDAO will develop all the military AI systems on its own. The individual military components, like the Navy or the Air Force, are also responsible for doing so. If the US Navy wants to develop an AI for autonomous vessels, it will do it individually. The CDAO is just there to support and coordinate these efforts, and when possible, it's there to identify opportunities for collaboration. For example, the Navy can develop autonomous fighter jets together with the Air Force, as they could both use them. With AI in general, the military aims for centralized coordination and decentralized execution. The military's components individually integrate AI into their systems, and the CDAO provides guidance. When it comes to the actual development of military AI technology, there are different ways of approaching it. Usually the military doesn't actually develop technology by itself. The M1 Abrams tank, one of the best US tanks, wasn't made by the Pentagon. Instead, it was designed by the company Chrysler Defense. These kinds of companies are called defense contractors, and they make much of the weapons for the military. In military terms, using commercial weapon development and manufacturing is called a defense acquisition. A key part of the Pentagon's strategy is to use this acquisition idea for new AI technologies. The department wants to develop an acquisition toolkit to get AI technology for tech companies. It's kind of similar to China's military civil fusion, but then the free market version. However, the idea of purchasing software from tech companies is very new for the US military. To do this, the Department of Defense needs to make some internal policy changes. First of all, it needs to make requirements for commercial AI software. The software needs to be tested on cybersecurity, performance, ethics, etc. So the Pentagon will need to make rules and guidelines for military AI technology. On top of that, it needs to strengthen ties with Silicon Valley companies, which is an unexpected turn of events. Traditionally, the department purchases things from corporations like Lockheed Martin or Boeing, but now it has to deal with big tech and Silicon Valley startups, because they are the ones who make innovative AI technologies. One of the first big projects the Pentagon launched with Silicon Valley contractors was Project Maven. This project started in 2017, and it was supposed to develop computer vision to analyze large amounts of video data. This would help the military identify objects from drones and other aerial footage. The Pentagon hired Google to make algorithms for this purpose, but that didn't end well. In 2018, the department asked Google to improve drone targeting, which could have lethal applications. Google employees rebelled because they didn't want to make deadly military technology. Soon after, Google pulled out of the contract. This was a major blow to the Pentagon, but it wasn't that big of a deal. Not long after, Microsoft and Amazon joined Project Maven. They were more positive about the military applications of technology. The Microsoft president said this in 2018, after the Pentagon collaboration was announced. We believe in the strong defense of the United States, and we want the people who defended to have access to the nation's best technology, including from Microsoft. In the same year, Jeff Bezos made clear that he agrees with this. If big tech companies are going to turn their back on the US Department of Defense, this country is going to be in trouble, patriot or not. Jeff Bezos clearly doesn't mind becoming a defense contractor. In fact, Amazon is already one of the biggest AI developers for the military. With its Amazon Web Services, the company has won a joint warfighting cloud capability contract. Basically, Amazon will start developing cloud systems for military use. It will help the Pentagon store data, which is crucial for developing all sorts of AI systems. But Amazon isn't the only company helping with the joint warfighting cloud capability. Oracle, Microsoft, and Google also won contracts. The total value of the four cloud development deals is $9 billion. 
We guess the defense business is too good for Google to reject after all. By the way, Google never really left Project Maven. Through its sister company, Google Ventures, the tech giant was still involved in the AI project. Google links startups like Orbital Insight, CrowdAI, or Clarif AI joined the Maven project when Google supposedly left. And believe it or not, Apple could also move into the defense industry. It has recently acquired an augmented reality company called Mira. The company makes VR headsets, and it has signed contracts with the US military. The Department of Defense wants to use these VR headsets combined with AI to train personnel. Training people in an artificial environment is much cheaper than conducting real-life exercises. Whether Apple would like to stay in this business is the question, but it can make a lot of money with the military. Anyways, it's clear that Silicon Valley's tech giants are starting to work with the Pentagon in mass. In the future, we could see the likes of Amazon or Google becoming major defense contractors, but in this new branch of defense contracting, we could also see some new names pop up. There are many tech companies that specifically focus on military technology. One of the biggest names on the list is Palantir Technologies, a company backed by billionaire Peter Thiel. The company was backed by the CIA's venture capital arm when it was founded, which says a lot about the sorts of products it makes. Palantir makes AI-backed data analysis tools, which have a lot of military applications. However, the company's entry into the military complex was quite dramatic. In 2016, Palantir sued the Pentagon in order to sell a product, and it won. This was a huge moment for commercial military technology in general. Basically, the Pentagon admitted that commercial software was better than what it could develop by itself. Taxpayer dollars would be spent more effectively on software from the market. From then on, tech startups actually had a chance to sell to the US military, and Palantir certainly did. The company has racked up US defense contracts ever since. This includes $463 million from the Special Operations Command, $100 million from the Air Force, and $229 million from the Army Research Lab. Palantir's products are incredibly valuable for the military, mainly for command and control purposes. Its AI software called Gotham can provide mission planning, defense decision making, and real-time battlefield intelligence. With commercial artificial intelligence like this, the United States can integrate AI into its military. And Palantir isn't the only company providing AI software to the Pentagon. The AI defense software business is spreading like wildfire. Lockheed Martin, Raytheon Technologies, and Northrop Grumman are all making artificial intelligence systems, just to name a few. The competition in the defense software space is heating up, which will only increase the quality of the AI products. Working together with these companies seems like the most effective strategy. They will become a major US defense contractors and solve the Pentagon's problem of having to develop AI systems. Now, back to the Pentagon's strategy. In order to make these high-tech AI systems work, you need a lot of data. We won't go over all of the technical details, but it comes down to this. Artificial intelligence is trained on data, and the more quality data you have, the better your AI will become. Here's an example. To improve military logistics with AI, you need to collect tons of data about military logistics to train the algorithm. The Pentagon realized how important this data is for artificial intelligence. Two years ago, it released a memo called Creating Data Advantage. The memorandum said that the military should transform itself into a data-centric organization. Data should be shared across the Department of Defense and stored using industry best practices. This links back to the joint warfighting cloud capability, which the tech giants are developing for the Pentagon. If anyone knows how to store insane amounts of data in a cloud, it's these corporations. And the US military has data to store. Back in 2017, the military was already collecting 22 terabytes of operational data every day. That's more than five seasons worth of video for the National Football League. All this operational data consists of information about battlefields, logistics, and transportation. And with the data inflow increasing by the year, this figure of 22 terabytes a day is likely much higher in 2023. The visual data alone has become gigantic in the military. Right now, US drone systems can see details the size of 6 inches from 20,000 feet high in the air. And these incredibly detailed drones can observe an area of 25 square kilometers all at once. One single drone can generate 6,000 terabytes of raw data in 24 hours, before it is compressed. This data is very valuable to collect, since it provides so much intelligence to the military. During a war, this drone will be able to spot every single enemy soldier within a huge range, but storing and processing these huge amounts of data is a giant issue. That's why creating a giant central data depository is a key part of the Pentagon's strategy. In the modern day, data is gold. 
Once you have the data stored and processed, you can start training the AI systems. And when it comes to AI systems, the Department of Defense has already made some big plans. Perhaps the biggest AI system that will be developed is the Joint All-Domain Command and Control System, or JADC2 in short. This is a very ambitious project because it will radically transform the American command and control operation. It'll change military planning, communication, and decision making. JADC2 seeks to build the most impressive military intelligence network to date, powered by AI. It'll connect all the data gathered by the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, the Space Force, and even US allies. This means that once a satellite or a drone detects enemy troops, it will immediately be shared with all military branches and allies. This communication network will be powered by AI to make it as swift as possible. The cloud that the Pentagon is developing is crucial for this because it will store all of this data. Eventually, the goal of the JADC2 network is to connect and coordinate all the aspects of the military. Because information is shared between all military branches, the system will improve joint planning and operations. It will reliably connect forces across land, air, sea, space, and cyberspace. Additionally, it will lead to seamless international collaboration as the intelligence is shared with allies. The other goal of the JADC2 network is to transform military planning and decision making. With AI, the data on the cloud will be analyzed to provide commanders with clear insights on the battlefield. This will provide commanders with real-time intelligence and recommendations for strategies and decisions. Because of this command and control support, the Pentagon hopes to improve and speed up military decision making. Once it is developed, the JADC2 system will prepare the US military for intelligent warfare. But when it comes to building the network itself, the Pentagon has an interesting policy. Each of the military branches will build their own systems for data gathering and AI command and control support. These separate systems will then be connected to each other. The Army has Project Convergence, the Navy has Project Overmatch, and the Air Force has the Advanced Battle Management System, or ABMS. This matches the idea of centralized coordination, but decentralized execution. The Department of Defense thinks that this will be much more effective for building the system. Although the JATC2 project is a major part of the Pentagon's AI strategy, it's not the only part. The Department of Defense also wants to integrate AI into physical combat and logistics. For physical combat, the US is trying to get autonomous vehicles and weapon systems. In the Air Force, this is happening very fast. It will acquire 1,000 Loyal Wingman drones, which are heavily armed AI-controlled aircraft. As the name suggests, these drones will support fighter jets in combat. There will be two drones per F-35. These drones will carry missiles, which will make fighter jets even more lethal in future military operations. But sometime in the future, the drones won't merely support the fighter jets. They could be the fighter jets themselves. The US Air Force is already transforming old F-16s into AI-controlled drones. The same is happening with helicopters, as the first autonomous Black Hawk helicopter has been created. In 2020, the Air Force flew a military U-2 plane with an AI co-pilot. AI-controlled fighter jets, helicopters, and planes aren't that far away. We could also see such radical changes in the US Army. Things like autonomous tanks aren't completed out of the picture. GD and Ryan Mittal have recently won a contract for an optionally manned fighting vehicle. This new vehicle is supposed to replace the old Bradley fighting vehicle. It'll have many semi-autonomous features, and the design will allow new, developing technologies to be added to the vehicle. As the name optionally manned suggests, this will mean that the vehicle should be able to drive on its own. Basically, once the AI technology is there, the fighting vehicle could become autonomous. Of course, fighting vehicles are different from tanks, but making tanks with AI features seems like the logical next step. And we shouldn't forget the US Navy, of course, as they also have a huge AI autonomy project. In 2021, it released a document called Unmanned, which describes this project. The Navy seeks to become a hybrid fleet with manned and unmanned vessels, submarines, and aircraft. It will develop and acquire unmanned surface vessels and unmanned underwater vehicles. In the Navy's plan for 2045, its fleet will have 150 autonomous vessels. In two years, it plans to acquire its first large-scale autonomous vessel. And autonomous submarines, well, they are already part of the Navy. The Orca submarine, developed by Boeing, is one of these unmanned underwater vehicles. Apart from these lethal applications, however, there are also less exciting ways the US wants to use AI. For example, the Army wants to get unmanned vehicles for military logistics. This shouldn't be too hard, since self-driving cars already exist. And the upside is huge. Unmanned vehicles are cheaper to operate, and there's less risk for humans getting attacked. 
AI will also be involved in managing the supply chains, which could bolster efficiency by 20%. The Air Force is using AI for predictive maintenance, which makes aircraft more reliable and efficient. So, the US is implementing AI in a lot of ways, but there's no doubt that China is trying to do the exact same thing. The PLA is also trying to get command and control systems and autonomous vehicles. So what is truly going to separate the US and China? First of all, the Pentagon wants to cooperate with its allies. According to the National Defense Authorization Act, supporting NATO's AI cooperation is crucial. NATO has launched the DIANA program, which is supposed to help with acquiring dual-use technology. You know, the same technology China is trying to get with military civil fusion? With the DIANA program, NATO will try to get the best innovators from the North Atlantic to improve its defenses. When the US is collaborating with the entire NATO alliance, it will have a lot more resources at its disposal. Another point from the National Defense Authorization Act is the strategic partnership with India on AI. India is the second country globally with a number of STEM graduates just behind China. India has a lot of talent for AI development, which is why a partnership with the country is lucrative for the United States. On top of that, India is a big enemy of China, which makes a partnership feasible. Taking advantage of its alliances is an opportunity for the United States to get ahead. But for the Pentagon, there's another even more important tactic to win the AI race, and that's stopping China. You see, the United States has one major advantage on China. Most of China's advanced chips are designed by American companies like Intel, AMD, or NVIDIA. These advanced chips are crucial for developing AI technology, and China is currently unable to make them by itself. And guess what the US did? Last year, it curbed many chip exports to China. This move damaged China's ability to progress in the AI field, something that Washington intended, of course. And the clampdown is still ongoing, as the Biden administration is considering sending even more AI chip restrictions. On top of that, Washington's allies have joined the restrictions. Japan and the Netherlands have stopped exporting key technologies for chip manufacturing to China. Without the products of companies like ASML, Chinese chip manufacturers are set back years. China won't be able to get advanced chips for a while, and this will undoubtedly hurt their AI capabilities. But restricting China's chip supply is harder than you think. You see, many Chinese companies that create dual-use artificial intelligence fall into a gray zone. They're not military suppliers, but they're not completely innocent either. Chinese tech companies could help the PLA with artificial intelligence because they create the technology for their own products. To completely isolate China from the advanced chips, Washington should target every single Chinese company that makes dual-use technology. It's impossible to look into the future to see which of the two wins the AI race. Both countries have laid out strategies to achieve AI superiority, but only one will be able to achieve it. However, one thing is certain. Warfare in the 21st century will be a whole lot different. Artificial intelligence will change every aspect of the military and revolutionize the way countries fight wars. It's important to see which country ends up winning the AI race, because it will decide who wins future wars. Let's just hope that this AI race doesn't spiral out of control. Last year, Biden said this. Are you willing to get involved militarily to defend Taiwan if it comes to that? Yes. You are? That's a commitment we made. But then just this year, the U.S. Secretary of State just backtracked Biden's comment and said this. We do not support Taiwan independence. We remain opposed to any unilateral changes to the status quo by either side. Why is the USA all of a sudden betraying Taiwan? It has to do with the law signed after World War II. But to truly understand this complicated web of diplomacy, we have to start from the beginning. We're sure most of you know the story of Taiwan, so we'll keep it brief. Now, the history of China and Taiwan is long, just like any other history. So we're gonna speed through it a little. In the 1800s, Taiwan was part of the Qing Empire, which basically ruled over all of current China and Taiwan. But in 1895, Japanese forces took over Taiwan, defeating the Qing government in the First Sino-Japanese War. And this is where we shift the focus to mainland China and skip forward a little. In 1912, the Republic of China, or the ROC, overthrew the Qing Empire and took control of mainland China. Remember this name, the ROC, as this is important to this day. Around the end of World War II, 
The ROC meets with the USA and UK and mentions to them, hey, Japan is controlling Taiwan, but it's kind of part of China. So while you guys are negotiating Japan's surrender, if you can throw in return of Taiwan to the ROC, we would really appreciate that. So the ROC, the current government of China, has complete control over mainland China and Taiwan. But while the ROC is distracted by all this, a full-scale civil war is started by the communist army, whose leader is this guy, Mao Zedong. After winning, he set up the People's Republic of China, or PROC, which eventually became the CCP. Now, the old government ROC flees mainland China and takes over Taiwan. We know it's a lot of acronyms, but we promise this will help make sense of current tensions. Now, at this point, both of these governments consider Taiwan to be part of China, but they disagreed on who is the true government of China. ROC claimed that they are the legitimate government of China, and PRC claimed they were the legitimate government. Now, Mao wasn't too happy with the old government taking a piece of China from him, so he decided to invade Taiwan, but lost. This was around the same time the outbreak of the Korean War and the US realized the strategic importance of Taiwan in having influence in Asia. So US President Harry S. Truman sent the US 7th Fleet to the Taiwan Strait to prevent an invasion of the island by communist armies from the mainland. At that time, due to the divide between the United States and the Soviet Union, the world split into communist and capitalist democratic blocs. Taiwan leader, Xiang, stood with the democratic blocs, and the United States and other Western countries supported his government's bid to represent China diplomatically and in the United Nations, and various other international organizations. In fact, the US recognized ROC as the legitimate government of China at this point. The US support for Taiwan was part of its broader policy of containment of communism, which sought to prevent the spread of Soviet and Chinese influence in Asia. The US saw Taiwan as a strategic ally and a bulwark against the spread of communism in the region. Three years later, after the first Taiwan Strait Crisis where the PLA shelled the Taiwanese islands near its coast, Washington signed a mutual defense treaty with Taiwan. It even went as far as to threaten a nuclear attack on China to show that it was serious about defending the island's sovereignty. Then in 1958, the second Taiwan Strait Crisis took place when the PRC shelled nationalist outposts of Kingman and Matsu Islands off the coast of Fujian province, after which the United States again intervened by sending ships into the Taiwan Strait. Two years later in 1960, Dwight Eisenhower became the first U.S. head of state to pay an official visit to a Chinese government when he met with Xiang Jieshi in Taiwan in June. Around the same time, tensions started boiling over between CCP and the Soviet Union. When CCP leaders took over the mainland, a friendly and productive relationship between Moscow and Beijing was considered vital for the advancement of world socialism. In late 1949, Mao traveled to Moscow to meet Joseph Stalin for the first time. Recognizing the need for unity, Stalin and Mao signed a bilateral treaty called the Treaty of Friendship, Alliance and Mutual Assistance. It included a military alliance that required one to come to the other's aid if they were attacked. More important to China were the treaty's economic benefits, including a $300 million loan and the provision of Soviet technical advisors. During the 1950s, thousands of scientists, industry experts, and technicians from the Soviet Union lived and worked in China. Their advice and leadership played an important role in the industrialization of China, using the advice of the Soviet economic strategists. Beijing committed itself to Stalinist models of development, growth, and agricultural collectivization. Yet during this successful collaboration, there were also signs of strain. Mao's 1949 visit to Russia negotiated a successful treaty, but privately, Mao felt undervalued and disrespected. The Chinese leader believed that Stalin had treated him as an underling rather than an important partner. In mid-1950, Mao committed forces to the Korean War, believing that Stalin would follow suit and commit Soviet forces and provide men, machinery, and weapons. Stalin, however, preferred not to be drawn into an open conflict with the United States. He confined Soviet involvement in Korea to providing air support and supplying aircraft, weapons, and munitions, for which he charged Mao's government full price. The Korean War was politically successful for the Chinese, but the costs to its struggling economy were enormous. Mao felt exploited and betrayed by Stalin, who had failed to honor his earlier assurances. After Stalin's death in 1953, Mao began to imagine himself as the world's senior communist leader. In the Soviet Union, leadership passed to Nikita Khrushchev, a party official who had previously shown unflinching loyalty to Stalin. This changed in February 1956, when Khrushchev delivered his famous secret speech, in which he condemned the personality cult, disposition, show trials, purges, and violence that occurred under Stalinism. For Mao, Khrushchev's secret speech was a betrayal of Stalin's legacy. 
Chinese communists responded by developing their own interpretation of Stalin, which was articulated in the People's Daily on April 5, 1956. Claiming that Stalin was a great Marxist, and he made mistakes that should be fixed. Sino-Soviet relations began to deteriorate shortly after, in part because of Khrushchev's softer line toward the West. While Mao had always attacked the United States as an imperialist bully to be feared and resisted, Khrushchev suggested that peaceful coexistence with the U.S. was possible. Khrushchev visited China in July 1958, but the meeting did not go well. The Soviet leader and his entourage were housed in dilapidated apartments without air conditioning, despite the sweltering heat. During the talks, Mao treated Khrushchev with arrogance and disdain, not dissimilar to how Mao had been treated by Stalin in 1949. Mao refused to consider Khrushchev's proposed joint defense projects. Khrushchev retaliated by pulling the majority of Soviet advisors out of China. Khrushchev visited China again the following year and infuriated Mao with a speech that praised U.S. President Dwight Eisenhower and his foreign policy. This particular trip was so acrimonious that it trimmed from seven days to just three. Then in 1960, Moscow began to repudiate terms of the 1949 military alliance, and within a year, the Treaty of Friendship, Alliance, and Mutual Assistance was all but dead, and the split seemed complete when the USSR recalled its last scientific and technical advisors from the PRC and cut off all assistance. Things got so bad between the communist nations, and they considered going to war. This is when President Kennedy administration considered opening ties with the PRC to fight the bigger problem at the time, the Soviet Union. This was more of an enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of situation. Assistant Secretary of State Roger Hillsman hinted for the first time in a public speech that United States wished to improve relations with the PRC. But no concrete progress was made since the US and PRC soon found each other on the opposite sides of the Vietnam War. The US government decided to escalate its involvement in Vietnam in the wake of the Tonkin Gulf incident. In early August 1964, two US destroyers stationed in the Gulf of Tonkin in Vietnam radioed that they had been fired upon by North Vietnamese forces. In response to these reported incidents, President Lyndon B. Johnson requested permission from the U.S. Congress to increase the U.S. military presence in Indochina. The large and growing U.S. presence in Vietnam posed a potential threat to the PRC, which began to send more military and technical assistance to the North Vietnamese. At the same time, Chinese engaged in mass demonstrations accusing the United States of imperialist actions. The same year, the PRC successfully tested its first atomic bomb and emerged as a nuclear power in its own right. This, of course, made Taiwan more worried about its safety. Over the next few years, the anti-war movement in the United States gained strength and the government heavily considered withdrawing from Vietnam and reducing U.S. military presence in Asia altogether. In fact, President Nixon ran on these platforms and won, thus reducing U.S. presence in Asia, which included a stoppage to regular patrols U.S. Navy made in Taiwan Straits. This opened the door for the official relationship building with the PRC, and after several rounds of backdoor diplomacy through go-betweens, National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger made a secret trip to the PRC in 1970 in order to meet with Zhao Enlai and other senior Chinese leaders to pave the way for a visit by President Nixon. He then made a second public trip in the fall to finalize arrangements. These trips marked the reopening of direct ties between Washington and Beijing after more than 20 years of non-recognition. Eventually in 1971, the Chinese seat in the United Nations was transferred from the Republic of China in Taiwan to the People's Republic of China. A year later, President Nixon arrived in Beijing, the first American head of state ever to set foot on the Chinese mainland. Nixon, Kissinger, and others met with Mao Zedong and Zhao Enlai, and at the end of the week-long visit, the two sides issued the Shanghai Communique. In this document, the United States and China stated their positions on a number of issues, including joint opposition to the Soviet Union, the U.S. intention to withdraw its military from Taiwan, and U.S. support for a peaceful settlement of the Taiwan question by the Chinese themselves. This began the process of full normalization of relations between the United States and the PRC. But Communique was a stroke of diplomatic genius. Let's dig into the details real quick. The Communique pledged both countries to work for normalization of relations and to expand people-to-people -people contacts and trade opportunities, in a not-so-thinly-veiled reference to the Soviet Union. The Communique declared that neither nation should seek hegemony in the Asia-Pacific region, and each is opposed to efforts by any other country or group of countries to establish such hegemony. Early in the negotiations, recognizing that China and the U.S. held many irreconcilable positions, Zhao Enlai proposed an unorthodox format for the Communique. The two sides essentially agreed to disagreed, each stating its views in separate paragraphs when necessary. 
On the thorny Vietnam issue, for example, the U.S. endorsed Nixon's latest peace plan, while China expressed firm support for the communist proposal. Yet despite the plan for unilateral declarations, Taiwan remained a stumbling block throughout the negotiations. While the U.S. sought improved relations with Beijing, it still officially recognized Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist government in Taiwan. In fact, the U.S. had been inching toward a two-China's policy for years. Only four months earlier, when the United Nations voted on whether to admit the People's Republic of China, the U.S. reversed its 20-year opposition to ceding the PRC, but opposed any effort to expel Taiwan. Ultimately, the U.S. lost the fight for dual representation. The PRC gained admission to the U.N., Taiwan was ousted, and the U.S. was left to juggle relations with two countries that both saw themselves as the sole legitimate government of all of China. The Chinese regarded the presence of American troops on Taiwan as a violation of China's sovereignty and pressed for full U.S. military withdrawal from the island. Nixon and Kissinger wanted to condition a withdrawal on enlisting China's help in ending the Vietnam War. And while China viewed its dealings with Taiwan as a strictly internal issue to be handled as it saw fit, the Americans insisted that the Chinese resolve the Taiwan question without the use of force. In the end, both sides made concessions. As Henry Kissinger wrote in his memoirs, neither the U.S. nor China was willing to let the Taiwan issue become an obstacle to their emerging new relationship. The basic theme of the Nixon trip and the Shanghai Communique was to put off the issue of Taiwan for the future to enable the two nations to close the gulf of 20 years and to pursue parallel policies where their interests coincided. The U.S. declared its interest in a peaceful settlement of the Taiwan question by the Chinese themselves and affirmed a total U.S. military withdrawal from the island as an ultimate objective. The U.S. also agreed to progressively reduce its forces and military installations on Taiwan as the tension in the area diminishes, thereby giving China a stake in the abatement of the Vietnam War. For its part, the PRC firmly rejected any two China's formulation, declaring unequivocally that the government of the People's Republic of China is the sole legal government of China and Taiwan is a province of China. The U.S., in deaf phrasing, acknowledged that all Chinese on either side of the Taiwan Strait maintained there is but one China and that Taiwan is part of China, but neatly avoided the question of who should govern this one China. But surprisingly, Nixon and Kissinger went significantly further on Taiwan in their private talks with Xiao than in the Communique. As recently released notes and transcripts reveal, the Americans offered Xiao extensive assurances that they intended to open full diplomatic relations with Beijing as soon as possible and were willing to sacrifice Taiwan to do so. In the wake of the Watergate scandal, however, Nixon was unable to carry through on these promises, and the U.S. didn't establish full diplomatic relations with the PRC until 1979, as we will soon get into. In 1974, Nixon was forced to resign because of Watergate, and in 1976, Mao passed away. This change in leadership delayed the normalization of relationships. After Deng Xiaoping took control of leadership in China, he restarted the negotiations on normalization. After several roadblocks in 1978, the two governments finally issued a joint communique that established full diplomatic relations. By this agreement, the United States recognized the PRC as the sole government of China and acknowledged that Taiwan is a part of China. At the same time, the United States ended official relations and its defense treaty with the nationalist regime on Taiwan. All in all, this communique reaffirmed most of what was decided in 1972 Shanghai Communique. The U.S. statement was careful to be vague. It acknowledged the PRC position that Taiwan is part of China. It did not accept that Taiwan is a part of China, just acknowledged. The U.S. was forced to break diplomatic ties with Taiwan, but it did its best to soften the blow. In the statement, the U.S. made sure to emphasize that the American people and the people of Taiwan will maintain commercial, cultural, and other relations without official government representation and without diplomatic relations. The United States is confident that the people of Taiwan face a peaceful and prosperous future. The United States continues to have an interest in the peaceful resolution of the Taiwan issue and expects that the Taiwan issue will be settled peacefully by the Chinese themselves. PRC, on the other hand, willfully ignored the use of acknowledgement by the USA. In his statement, the PRC said that the USA accepts that the government of the People's Republic of China is the sole legal government of China and Taiwan is part of China. As for the way of bringing Taiwan back to the embrace of the motherland and reunifying the country, it is entirely China's internal affair. The U.S. did all it could to keep the PRC happy, all while never actually giving up on Taiwan. The PRC, on the other hand, was more than happy to take the U.S. statements as full recognition and run with it. 
This started the officially unofficial U.S. policy of strategic ambiguity. There was no agreement over the status of Taiwan, just ambiguity, and that was by design. This, of course, didn't please the Taiwanese government, which was said in this statement. In the past few years, the United States government has repeatedly reaffirmed its intention to maintain diplomatic relations with the Republic of China and to honor its treaty agreements. Now that it has broken the assurances and abrogated the treaty, the United States government cannot be expected to have the confidence of any free nation in the future. The U.S. soon fixed this issue too. Later the same year, 1979, President Carter enacted the Taiwan Relations Act, which committed the United States to provide military and other support to Taiwan and provided guidelines for future trade and other relations. This made the PRC unhappy, so there were more negotiations over the Third Communique, where the United States agreed to reduce its arms sales to Taiwan and China agreed to emphasize a peaceful resolution of the Taiwan issue. However, the Reagan administration offered private assurances to Taiwan that it would continue to support the island and its government. The next year, Deng Xiaoping proposed the one country, two systems approach for reunification with both Hong Kong and Taiwan. This one country, two systems option said that it would allow Taiwan significant autonomy if it agreed to come under Beijing's control. This system underpinned Hong Kong's return to China in 1997, and the manner in which it was governed until recently, when Beijing finally sought to increase its influence. China pledged to preserve much of what makes Hong Kong unique when the former British colony was handed over more than two decades ago. Beijing said it would give Hong Kong 50 years to keep its capitalist system and enjoy many freedoms not found in mainland Chinese cities. But alas, that was not the case. Beijing has been chipping away at Hong Kong's freedom since the handover. For instance, in 2003, the Hong Kong government proposed national security legislation that would have prohibited treason, secession, sedition, and subversion against the Chinese government. In 2012, it tried to amend Hong Kong schools curricula to foster Chinese national identity, which many residents saw as Chinese propaganda. And in 2014, Beijing proposed a framework for universal suffrage, allowing Hong Kongers to vote for the city's chief executive, but only from a Beijing approved shortlist of candidates. Protesters organized massive rallies known as the Umbrella Movement to call for true democracy. In the years following the 2014 protests, Beijing and the Hong Kong government stepped up efforts to rein in dissent, including by prosecuting protest leaders, expelling several new legislators, and increasing media censorship. Beijing took its most assertive action yet on June 30, 2020, when it bypassed the Hong Kong legislator and imposed a national security law in the city. The legislation effectively criminalizes any dissent and adopts extremely broad definitions for crimes such as terrorism, subversion, secession, and collusion with foreign powers. It also allows Beijing to establish a security force in Hong Kong and influence the selection of judges who hear national security cases. Pro-democracy activists and lawmakers decreed the move and expressed fears that it could be the end of Hong Kong. Meanwhile, Chinese officials and pro-Beijing lawmakers said it was necessary to restore stability following the massive protests. Authorities have used the law to try to eliminate all forms of political opposition. They disqualified pro-democracy candidates from running in elections and removed elected lawmakers for publicly opposing China's control over Hong Kong. Police have arrested at least 170 people under the law, many of them prominent pro-democracy activists, former lawmakers, and journalists. Thousands more people have been arrested for participating in the 2019 protests. Beijing and the Hong Kong government have also curbed media freedoms, with pro-democracy publications such as the Apple Daily newspaper closing after journalists were harassed and jailed. Moreover, groups that organized protests disbanded. The Hong Kong government's efforts to transform the public education system by introducing so-called patriotic programs have also troubled many parents and students. These moves have by and large ended mass public protests and silenced many Hong Kong residents who fought for democracy. Thousands of people, including prominent activists, have fled the city. Following another weekend of protests. Police are clashing with protesters in Hong Kong. Are trying to stop a controversial proposed law. About 30,000 demonstrators against traders from mainland China. Tension between the two sides has heightened in recent weeks. China is accused of snooping on its neighbor. Taiwanese authorities have detained four military officers. Why are officers within the Taiwanese military spying for China? Yeah, so it didn't go as planned in Hong Kong, and Taiwan saw this coming and rejected the offer back then. All the while, China-U.S. relations took a hit too, after what happened at Tiananmen Square in 1989. 
The United States and other nations imposed economic sanctions on China, and many U.S. citizens evacuated the country. President George H.W. Bush maintained communications with senior Chinese leaders, and twice sent Brent Scowcroft and Lawrence Eagleburger on secret missions to Beijing to reassure Deng Xiaoping and the Chinese leadership that the United States would maintain ties. Tensions continued into the next year, with criticisms aired from both sides, although diplomatic ties were never severed and China remained open to foreign trade. Shifting focus to another parallel story, U.S.'s ambiguity isn't the only thing as ambiguous in China-Taiwan relationship. Both countries themselves have a deal whose ambiguity has caused tensions among them. In the 1980s, China and Taiwan opened up to each other after 40 years of no contact. Both sides set up semi-official organizations to regulate the growing numbers of exchanges across the Taiwan Strait. In 1992, these organizations reached a compromise on the nature of cross-strait ties that the KMT would eventually name the 1992 Consensus. The consensus rests on agreement between Taiwan's ruling party, KMT, and the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, that there is only one China. Though both sides define China differently, CCP claims that during this consensus, Taiwanese leaders agreed that Taiwan is part of China, which is technically true, but Taiwanese leaders did claim that China belongs to the government of Taiwan, not the PRC. While all of this was going on, Taiwan started to find its own identity. Citizens in Taiwan now consider themselves Taiwanese and not Chinese, and the Taiwanese government actually has no problem leaving mainland China to the CCP. It just doesn't want the CCP in Taiwan. In fact, in 1994, Taiwan held its first ever democratic election to elect its leaders. To oppose democracy and Taiwanese people having the right to vote, China gathered up a bunch of troops and military equipment on the shore nearest to Taiwan and started a show of force. This is when Washington shows up to protect Taiwan, as promised by U.S. law. The U.S. Navy brings out all of its biggest and most advanced ships, missiles, and jets. This was just to send the message that a war with Taiwan meant a war with the world's most powerful military. China was forced to ease up and tensions calm back down. Now, as if democracy in a Chinese-claimed region wasn't bad enough, in 2000, the new president openly backed independence from China. This scared the CCP and they made a new law, the anti-secession law, stating China's right to use non-peaceful means against Taiwan if it tried to secede from China. As if they hadn't tried military action before? Because of their open support for independence, the DPP party has been nicknamed the pro-independence party, and when they're in power in Taiwan, China becomes more and more aggressive with their threats towards Taiwan. Since early 2000, things have changed in Taiwan. Its transition from authoritarian rule to a representative electoral system was gradual and peaceful. Now, Taiwan has a healthy democracy with two main political parties, the DPP and the KMT. As mentioned before, DPP is the pro-independence party, and KMT is often referred to as a pro-reunification party. Much like USA politics, the nicknames often don't tell the full story. But before going over that, Let's quickly cover Taiwan's economic growth and how China's issue plays into that. Taiwan is slightly bigger than the US state of Maryland, or about half the size of Scotland, and has a population of 23 million, which is just over a quarter of Germany's population. Economically though, Taiwan is punching way above its weight. In 2021, Taiwan GDP per capita was $33,000, about three times as high as China, which has only $12,000 of GDP per capita. Even though Taiwan is much richer than China, it's still heavily dependent on the mainland. China is Taiwan's most important trading partner, followed by the United States. More than 42% of Taiwan's exports go to China, from where Taiwan gets around 22% of its imports. In 2020, goods and services worth $166 billion were exchanged between the two countries. 
This all started when, supposedly, pro-China party KMT won the Taiwanese presidency in 2008. Between 2008 to 2014, Taiwan signed more than 20 pacts with the PRC, including the 2010 Cross Straits Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement, in which they agreed to lift barriers to trade. China and Taiwan resumed direct sea, air, and mail links that had been banned for decades. They also agreed to allow banks, insurers, and other financial service providers to work in both markets. CCP believed that the more dependent Taiwan becomes on China, the easier it would be to integrate the country into CCP rule. But unfortunately for the CCP, that's not how things panned out. In 2014, KMT and CCP tried to sign a cross strait service trade agreement, CSSTA, a follow-up treaty from ECFA. This would start to list out the areas in which the corporations from each side can invest and work in, but many young people in Taiwan opposed this agreement. On the evening of March 18, 2014, a group of Taiwanese students stormed the national legislator with demands to renege the CSSTA. Unexpectedly, their hastily planned action evolved into a 24-day confrontation. The so-called Sunflower Movement, named after the floral gifts sent to protesters as a symbol of hope, won widespread public sympathy in Taiwan. Thousands of supporters camped on the streets surrounding the legislator, which made it difficult for the government to evict the intruders. Yet the government refused to accept demands from the protesters to postpone the free trade agreement. Seeing that the movement was losing steam, student leaders opted for a voluntary withdrawal and claimed to have achieved partial success. To these young protesters, China's growing sharp power in Taiwan was clearly felt in the steady erosion of press freedom, academic freedom, and other individual political rights. The Sunflower Movement became a political trigger point precisely because the disputed push for trade liberalization with China was perceived to benefit big corporations at the expense of individuals. Consequently, many citizens feared that closer economic integration with China would compromise Taiwan's political autonomy and self-governing status. The Sunflower Movement had far-reaching political reverberations. Humiliated by internal divisions and its inability to solve the political crisis, the KMT suffered back-to-back -back electoral defeats. The so-called Pro-Independence Democratic Progressive Party DPP, won the presidency and the legislative majority in a landslide in January 2016. Once the DDP won the presidency in 2016, they quickly got to work on solving the dependency on China. President Xia has had some success boosting trade with and investment in countries in Southeast Asia and the Indo-Pacific through a signature initiative, the New Southbound Policy. Trade between Taiwan and the 18 targeted countries nearly doubled between 2016, when the initiative was unveiled, and 2022. Taiwanese investment in those countries has also steadily increased. In 2019, Tsai unveiled a three-year plan to incentivize Taiwanese manufacturers to move from mainland back to Taiwan. Still in 2021, Taiwan's exports to China hit an all-time high. Beijing has pressured countries not to sign free trade agreements with Taiwan. A handful of countries have signed free trade pacts with the island. New Zealand and Singapore are the only developed economies to sign such agreements. Beijing has also pushed for Taiwan's exclusion from multilateral trading blocs, including the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP, and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP. All the while, Taiwan is working toward becoming less dependent on China. China is only growing stronger and stronger, economically and militarily. Since its acceptance to the World Trade Organization, China's economy has boomed. This has enabled the CCP to strengthen its military and flex its muscle geopolitically around the world. The Chinese military budget has increased fivefold since 2021, and it now fields the world's largest missile force, the second largest navy, and the third largest air force. Of course, it would be wrong of us to not mention the goal of Chinese leader Xi Jinping. His goal is to become the greatest leader in China's history. He wants to achieve that by doing something that has never been done before, the great unification of the Chinese nation. He wants to bring Taiwan back under China peacefully, but while showing off tanks in the military. It is pretty similar to when you are getting mugged and the guy flashes his gun but says, I don't want any problems, just give me your wallet. So whenever there are talks about Taiwan independence, it gives China a perfect excuse to flex its muscles. Now here's where the problems start. Even though the Taiwan's president openly backed independence in 2000, that's not the case anymore. Nor do the Taiwanese citizens want independence. Most recent surveys show that only 5% of Taiwanese want independence. The vast majority, around 82%, just want the status quo to continue. That strategic ambiguity. They just want peace and freedom. Even DPP leader and current president Tsai has tiptoed around enraging China. 
she has reaffirmed that Taiwan has no need to declare independence. Instead, she has attempted to find another formulation that will be acceptable to Beijing. But she isn't looking for a compromise. In a 2019 speech, she reiterated China's long-standing proposal for Taiwan that it be incorporated into the mainland under the formula of one country, two systems. This is the same formula used for Hong Kong, which was guaranteed the ability to preserve its political and economic systems and granted a high degree of autonomy. Such a framework is deeply unpopular among the Taiwanese public. Pointing to Beijing's recent crackdown on Hong Kong's freedoms, Tsai and even the KMT have rejected the one country, two systems framework. This, of course, has pushed Xi and PLA to use more and more force to intimidate Taiwan. The Chinese military is waging what defense experts call a gray zone campaign. It is increasing its presence closer to Taiwan one step at a time, yet all the while remaining below the threshold of what could be considered an act of war. Since September 2020, when Taiwan first started publishing data on Chinese military activity in its air defense identification zone, the number of monthly incursions into Taiwan's ADIZ by the PLA has ballooned from 69 to 139 this July. An ADIZ is a self-declared buffer zone in international airspace in which countries monitor flight movements for potential security threats. But as the airspace above the contiguous zone is outside Taiwan's jurisdiction, the PLA's behavior does not violate international law. Over the past three years, Beijing has gone from occasional flights into Taiwan's ADIZ by one or two military reconnaissance or transport aircraft to almost daily incursions by often large groups of planes including bombers, fighters, electronic warfare aircraft, aerial refueling planes, and various kinds of drones. In addition, the PLA has expanded its area of operations from mainly the southwestern corner of Taiwan's ADIZ, the crossroads between the shallow Taiwan Strait, the South China Sea, and the Bashi Channel which connects both to the open Pacific, to the airspace and waters all around Taiwan. Then, after a hiatus of almost two years, the PLA flew more than 300 such crossings in August last year during the unprecedented exercises it held around Taiwan to punish it for hosting then-U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. PLA officers boasted on Chinese state television that they had successfully obliterated the median line. Since then, dozens of PLA aircraft have crossed the line each month. After the PLA aircraft approached its contiguous zone last month, Taiwanese defense officials worry it will be the next line the Chinese military crosses. Although the U.S. Navy has continued its regular transits up and down the Taiwan Strait, there has been no direct response to these Chinese moves by the U.S. military. The U.S. administration continues to debate on how best to apply its policy of strategic ambiguity. New form of this policy is making sure that Beijing knows the U.S. will defend Taiwan if there was an invasion, but also not provoke Beijing into invading by irresponsibly supporting Taiwanese independence. The only issue with this strategy is it only works as long as China believes that the U.S. will intervene and the U.S. military overpowers the Chinese military. As Beijing's military capabilities have increased, pivotal deterrence has steadily faltered. In 1996, Beijing fired missiles over the island to protest the Taiwanese president speaking at his college reunion in the United States. But it avoided further provocation after Washington sailed two aircraft carriers through the strait. After Pelosi's 2022 trip to Taiwan, China responded with military exercises and missile overflights. Washington restricted itself to verbal condemnation and avoided any military displays, even as the Chinese People's Liberation Army has continued its coercion and incursions. Further strategic ambiguity is largely irrelevant to whether China decides to attack Taiwan. Many experts believe China has already priced in a full U.S. defense. Its operational plans assume Washington will intervene. U.S. and allied power, not ambiguity, is what deters China ambiguity by itself, offers little additional benefit. That means that if anything is likely to deter Chinese aggression, it is further improvements to the Taiwan security. Strategic ambiguity could cause more harm than good on this front as well. U.S. intervention is essential to defeating a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Taipei must ensure that the United States shows up and arms sale are the clearest and strongest indication of U.S. support. Taipei purchases high-end weapon systems, believing that Washington's willingness to sell these platforms raises the likelihood that it will step in to defend the island. Taiwan's best strategy is an asymmetric porcupine defense, which is embodied in a Taiwanese military plan called the Overall Defense Concept. The island would bristle with mines and anti-ship, anti-air, and anti-vehicle missiles, buying time for the U.S. military to arrive. However, high-end equipment like F-16 aircraft, heavy tanks, and submarines are useless for this mission. They are likely to be destroyed in any invasion's opening salvo. 
but Taipei cannot fully switch to asymmetric defense because strategic ambiguity leaves it uncertain whether Washington will intervene. This creates a U.S. problem in Taiwanese politics. Former Taiwanese President Ma ying stated, The Americans will sell us weapons and provide us with intelligence, but they won't send troops. KMT, his political party, is skeptical of Washington's intentions, prompting some members to advocate greater autonomy in Taiwan's defense decisions. If this were to happen in Taiwan, Washington would lose a critical partner in strategic competition with China. Beijing could use Taiwan as an unsinkable aircraft carrier to project power into the Pacific, choke off U.S. support to China and South Korea, dominate the Philippines, and further consolidate control over the South China Sea. Strategic ambiguity seems to have snared the United States and Taiwan in a prisoner's dilemma. Washington wants Taipei to increase defense spending and implement its porcupine strategy before making further unspecified commitments. Taiwan spends a larger proportion of its government budget on defense than even the United States, but it wants to receive the U.S. commitment its defense concept depends on before further implementation. The Taiwanese will to fight increases significantly if Washington intervenes. Each side's strategy hinges on the other's actions, and each side is stuck waiting while China continues modernizing its military. Well, China has finally done it. It's called social credit. Social credit. Social credit. A system of judging the civilian's morality. They're constantly monitored by facial recognition cameras. The Chinese Communist Party has finally managed to put the final nail in the coffin of any sort of independence or democracy in China. This isn't just my opinion. Take it from America's former vice president, Mike Pence, who said this of the system. China's rulers aim to implement an Orwellian system, the so-called social credit score. Why is all this being said? Well, because of threats like this. China's government wants to eventually rate everyone on their conduct. It's a plan to regulate business and citizen behavior. The government gives you a score, and the score is a measure of how trustworthy you are as a citizen. If you do something good, you get a boost. And people accused of bad behavior are being penalized. There are serious consequences. We're used to it, and anyway, we don't have a choice. It's a mess. Alarm bells are ringing the world over. As China's framework, meant to theoretically report on the trustworthiness of individuals, corporations, and governmental entities across China, now poses a greater threat to human rights than anything we've seen in the 21st century. Debates are raging all over America, Europe, and the world over whether this should even be allowed to stand or if the world should step up in the name of democracy, peace, and human rights. The first question is what is China's social credit system at all? To understand what the system is like, we need to understand what social credit is in the first place. When the Chinese government talks about social credit, the term covers two different things. The first is traditional financial credit worthiness, and the second is social credit worthiness. A statistic that draws data from a larger variety of sectors. The first part, the traditional financial credit worthiness is something you are all pretty much aware of, because it exists heavily in the Western culture. Think of the way your financial history is documented by banks and other institutions so that it can be able to predict your ability to pay back future loans. That's pretty much it. That's basically the root of the credit score we try so heavily to raise with our every action. However, America has had decades upon decades to perfect this system. Here we use the FICO system, with the ultimate mark being the FICO credit scores. These are used as a method of quantifying and evaluating an individual's credit worthiness. FICO scores are used in 90% of mortgage application decisions in the United States. Scores range from 300 to 850, with scores in the 670 to 739 range considered to be good credit scores. I wonder what yours is. Too personal? Okay, fine. I'll drop it. By the time the FICO system was nationally standardized in 1989, it had undergone years of development, dating all the way back to the late 1800s. China has lacked that advantage, because despite being well-developed, China's modern economy is quite young, so to say. Because of this, the country lacks a reliable system to look up other people's and companies' financial records. Part of this social credit system we're discussing today is meant to rectify that to build a system aimed to help banks and other market players make business decisions. So that's it for the first part, the social credit element. Let's move on. This one was pretty straightforward. It's the second part that gets the emotions and debates going. As I mentioned before, when the Chinese government talks about social credit, the term covers two different things. 
The second thing is called social creditworthiness. And that's where the alleged problem is. By social creditworthiness, what the Chinese government is putting across is that in order for society to perform at its peak morality, there needs to be a higher level of trust and cooperation embedded into society from the individuals. That trust that is needed in society is solidified by fighting off stains to public morality. Stains like corruption, telecom scams, tax evasion, false advertising, academic plagiarism, product counterfeiting, and pollution to say the least. Basically, everything that is wrong needs to be removed from society with the facilitators of such horrific things punished brutally. By enforcing a system of social creditworthiness, the government as the parental structure will hold all individuals and companies accountable for their actions in the pursuit of a utopian society. So in the same way that a financial credit score system can instantly tell you about a person's financial capability and financial responsibility, the Chinese government is creating a system where social credit can do the same. But concerning morality and social trustworthiness, as we go on, I just want you to sit and stew on that for a moment. So, because of this, China's social credit system is widely viewed in the West as a digital surveillance system to categorize and guide people through reward and punishment. Although, in a way it is, it might not be as intense as Western media pushes it to be. So what really is it then? What's the truth? Well, it's complicated, as I'm sure you're already gathering. The social credit system in China should be understood as a method, a mentality of governance, if you will and not just a network of databases and policies to monitor trustworthiness. Due to the implications that may happen when the government crosses the line into morality, mixing church and state, if you will, China's social credit system has widely been viewed as draconian. It's been taken as a mass surveillance scheme, a way designed by the CCP to snoop on private citizens and punish them for perceived social transgressions. Looking at corporations, the information that is collected includes anything that could make a company be deemed trustworthy or untrustworthy in society. For example, engaging in anti-competitive or monopolistic activity, engaging in illegal or unethical tax practices, damaging the environment, or engaging in deceptive consumer practices could all be included on a company's credit record with a negative reflection. That is because the company would be deemed to be, well, untrustworthy and so it will be eligible to face negative consequences. But this is not limited to the bad and ugly only. If a corporation is making positive contributions to society, such as setting up social programs, donating to charitable causes, or other corporate social responsibility activities, then there will be a positive impact on a company's credit score. This is because the company would have proved itself to be trustworthy. That's the system. Pretty simple, right? Hmm, not so much. You get the idea. The CCP is so serious about enforcing this that last year, the General Office of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China and the General Office of the State Council released a document titled The Opinions on Promoting the Construction of a Social Credit System with High Quality Development and Promoting the Formation of a New Development Pattern. These opinions outline 23 measures for how the social credit system can improve trust in society across a wide range of fields and industries. This includes improving consumer and investor confidence and foreign trade, guiding the financial industry to provide better support for market entities, improving the overall business environment by streamlining bureaucratic procedures, and even helping China reach its carbon reduction targets. So you see this social credit system is quite an impactful system in China, both for individuals and for corporations. It has the potential for massive positive and negative ramifications depending on how it'll be handled. I'll leave you to decide how you think the CCP will use this, and tell me your thoughts in the comment section as we progress with the video. Before I bombard you with more information, let's dive into the history of this social credit system. What could possibly have occurred that made an entire nation's administration decide to judge people's trustworthiness? Let's find out. Before that, real quick. The Wall Street Journal reports that slowing exports could cause rippling recessions worldwide. This would be devastating, as the S&P 500 is currently being carried by only seven major companies. In fact, the median stock is only up 5% this year. Meanwhile, in the last three quarters, Warren Buffett sold $33 billion in stocks. What's he seeing that we don't? 
It's a dire situation for those of us holding stocks or a 401k, but luckily not every market is so precarious. In fact, the art market has sustained through the uncertainty. And our sponsors at Masterworks are giving you access to the luxury commodity with store of value potential. Masterworks now has 16 sales to date, with each of them returning a profit to investors. Of those 16 exits, recent net returns include 17%, 35%, and even 77%. It's easy to see why offerings have sold out within hours. Masterworks has over 300 plus offerings on their platform. Over 800,000 people have signed up so far. And with the markets rapidly approaching a crossroads, demand for Masterworks is growing by the day. But since they're a longtime sponsor, my subscribers can skip the line and start their collection today by clicking the link in the description. This entire social credit system was conceived in 1999 when then premier Zhu Rongji sought to ease the difficulty of foreign firms in obtaining information in their Chinese partners. His crack at this was meant to make business and investments much easier as foreign firms could have a basis of what local Chinese firms to work with. This system was to be later mentioned at the 16th Party Congress in 2002 as a part of the effort by the Chinese Communist Party to create a unified, open, competitive, and orderly modern market system. For years following that, it was discussed in official documents only in the context of market reforms. In 2007, credit, tax, and contract performance records were suggested as potential elements of one's social credit status. These were the building blocks of the system being pieced together one at a time. As this went on, the Interministerial Conference on Social Credit System Construction was organized, consisting mostly of government bodies in charge of development, commerce, and taxation. This facilitated several things. For one, when a person engages in a trust-breaking behavior, the name and the social credit code of the individual will be published on the online blacklist, along with details about the deed and the following legal sanctions. The trust-keeping equivalents will be announced on the online red list. These black and red lists will be publicly searchable, making them public information and putting the victims at public scrutiny. More than just public scrutiny, the system is designed to have punishment and reward facets that keep it going. For example, once an individual is discovered to have engaged in dishonest behavior, he faces restrictions on a wide range of activities directly and indirectly related to the behavior. For instance, a failure to act upon a court judgment can lead to limitations on not only applications for government subsidies or certain professional licenses, but also sales of assets, operation of business, use of transportation, and consumption of luxury items. That's quite the government spanking, isn't it? Effectively, you can't function properly as a citizen. Under this system, no one violates the rules and goes unpunished. Part of me sees the draconian way of operations in this, but at the same time, you can't help but think that some crimes could be stopped or handled by such means. I'm sure you can think of a few brutes who would deserve this. Without mincing words, this social credit system is just a modern, data-powered, public shaming and interactive propaganda platform. It fits well within Chinese culture too. Already, even before the social credit system, China had in place what are called public sentence rallies. If you are an avid reader, this article is something you might find interesting. But read it after the video. You don't want to miss the juicy parts. The gist of it, though, is this. The public sentencing rally is a judicial event in which the verdict and sentence of a criminal case already decided in court is announced publicly in a venue such as a stadium or auditorium. Sentencing rallies provide an important organizational and operational avenue through which communicative actions of blaming and shaming are constituted and relayed to their social audience. The CCP loves to facilitate this. Because on one hand, the sentencing of a criminal in a public venue symbolically asserts the party's control over public spaces, reinforcing the power of the party. At the same time, it also serves to educate citizens about the costs of breaking the law. The social credit system is now the newer, a modern variant of this traditional system. It basically brings this traditional model to the online space by disclosing the identity of individuals, the details about their behaviors, and subsequent punishments. The social credit system also functions as a propaganda channel that cuts through both the online and offline worlds. 
previously, even if the government publicly denounced an individual in newspapers or film screenings, these announcements often went unnoticed by people who didn't use these channels, thereby reducing the government's intended effect. But not anymore. Now, in the modern age, the people will know. Under the social credit system, however, sanctions and rewards are distributed in a more universal and standardized manner. Not everyone who did the same good behaviors will be listed on the red list, but people with similar social credit standings will still be able to access the same benefits. In turn, individuals on the blacklist and the red list facilitate the spread of the government's message by serving as models from whom others can learn. It sounds like a dream system for the CCP's power-hungry agents, and hence their push to make it more universal and widespread. I know some of you watching this from the United States or other Western countries may be in shock or fuming right now. It's natural to wonder how this social credit system would work in your own country were it to be implemented. Speaking from my own experience, I know that a social credit system would cause an uproar here in the United States. I mean the resistance to it would edge on the boundaries of civil war itself. So why are the Chinese people quiet about it? Well, part of the reason for this is because of the different cultural landscape. It goes without saying that American and Chinese cultures are very different. While here in the US, individual liberties and privacy rights are big, Chinese society is wired a bit differently. You see, traditional Confucian philosophy values morality over respect for individual rights as the guiding principle for interpersonal relationships and the government of a society. These are the traditional cultural values engraved in Chinese society and in the masses. As the conceptual barrier between each individual is not clear, privacy has traditionally meant family intimacy or shameful secrets. Chinese law, except for instance specific clauses such as protection against unlawful search or detention, generally treats the right to privacy mostly as a right to preserve one's reputation against insult and libel. So when the social credit system was implemented, some, if not most, see it as something that falls in line with the culture and rule of law that has traditionally been in China. On top of the traditions embedded in Chinese society, there is another factor. In a way, you could call it subservience or indoctrination. You see, Chinese society is truly no stranger to severe forms of surveillance by the government. This isn't just recent either. No, it dates back to the days of Mao Zedong, the former president of the People's Republic of China. Since those days, the Chinese government has kept Dong On. Dong On is a Chinese word meaning archived file, used in the political and administrative context. It means a permanent dossier or archival system that records the performance and attitudes of citizens of mainland China. So what has been going on is that for years, China has been keeping a secret dossier on millions of its urban residents that maintains influence in the public sector to this day. The information included in the dossier ranges from one's educational and work performance, family background, and records of self-criticism to mental health conditions. But individuals do not have access to their Dong An. Only the government does. When a completely opaque, vague, shadow-like system like Dong An has been in place for decades, an intrusive program like the social credit system may feel less objectionable to the Chinese public. In fact, it is far preferable. China has too many surveillance systems in the nation. Big data surveillance exists in various systems all across the country. In Xinjiang, an autonomous region in western China, home to the Uyghur Muslim minority, the government is collecting a vast array of citizens' information, many of them intrusive and in many cases illegal. The government collects citizen information including but not limited to DNA samples, iris scans, voice samples, applications installed on phones, and records of power consumption. All this in order to search for suspected criminals. I made a video on the persecution of the Uyghur population and how they are suppressed and persecuted by the CCP. You really should take a look at it. Familiarize yourself with their plight. To put it nicely, it's not pretty. It's brutal oppression of the Muslim Uyghur minority. The Uyghurs are facing genocide because of our religion and our ethnicity. The UN thinks a million Uyghurs are being detained in camps, maybe more. This is forced labor, this is forced sterilization, things that we haven't seen in an awfully long time in this world. Ethnic tensions between the native Uyghur community and the majority Han Chinese have existed for years. A million Uyghurs, as you pointed out, are in concentration camps. I suffered that in human treatment for seven months. Even animals aren't subjected to that. 
So, when you see the negative effects of all this surveillance, as it leads to minorities being put in re-education camps, you can see just what the social credit system could lead to. It is really quite a fine line in any society. I suppose that is what the inherent fear is with the entire system. The idea of how far the CCP will go in trying to keep its citizens under surveillance. So insinuations aside, what are the rewards and punishments that currently exist in the social credit system as we have seen in actual practice? Well, let's look at a few of them. Let's start by examining this element of the social credit system. Here, drivers are being monitored, and if you fail to drive at the speed limit, it'll cost you heavily. Practices and daily facets of everyday society like bad driving and debt could get you downgraded in the social ranking system. And as I mentioned before, if you go low enough, it might create challenges for you in society. Much like your private credit scores, a person's social score can move up and down depending on their behavior. To date, we do not quite know how exactly the algorithms behind the ratings work, but examples of infractions include bad driving, smoking in non-smoking zones, buying too many video games, and posting fake news online, specifically about terrorist attacks or airport security. Anything can be a violation, even things that the CCP alone deems detrimental to society. This is why other punishable offenses include spending too long playing video games, wasting money on frivolous purchases, and posting on social media. It's quite intense, isn't it? The punishments extend to companies as well. Financial firms in particular can be punished for financial fraud, evasion of bank debts, insider trading, the deployment of fake insurance policies, disinformation, and illegal fundraising, according to the Financial Review. I won't go into every punishable offense, but you get the idea. So, what kind of punishment would hurt the everyday person? How about punishments that include travel bans and slow internet? China has already started punishing people by restricting their travel, including banning them from flights. It's been recorded by the National Public Credit Information Center that authorities have banned people from purchasing flights 17.5 million times by the end of 2018. While we're still on travel, those who have lower social rankings have been barred from getting business class train tickets, and some are kept out of the best hotels. It's also been said that throttled internet speeds will be a consequence of being found on the other side by the system. The effects, or rather punishments, continue though. If found on the wrong side, you or your kids could also miss out on the best jobs and schools. Do you think this is a reach? It isn't. In 2017, 17 people who refused to carry out military service were barred from enrolling in higher education, applying for high school, or continuing their studies. A direct quotation from this article from the South China Morning Post said, 17 students have been blacklisted by the Chinese authorities for refusing to carry out military service. A statement from the authorities in the northeastern city of Jilin said the young men had been banned from taking government jobs or enrolling in university. They were also prohibited from taking flights and staying in hotels. The group that has been blacklisted will now be banned from leaving the country or using high-speed trains. They will also face restrictions on taking on loans and insurance, as well as buying a house or other expensive assets. They are also barred from sitting the university entrance examination and will not be allowed to enroll in any secondary institutions or repeat their current school years. They could also forget about ever getting a job with the government or government-affiliated organizations and could be fined by their local governments. The penalties fall under the country's sweeping social credit system that rewards and punishes citizens for a wide range of activities. What all this says in so many words is that their lives are destroyed. That's the kind of system the CCP has built in China. A system where freedoms can be legally right but morally punishable. This system punishes not just the perpetrators of these acts, but their families as well with no discrimination. In July of 2018, a Chinese university denied an incoming student his spot because the student's father had a bad social credit score for failing to repay a loan. This is just one case among thousands of students who got punished the same way for their parents' misgivings. The danger of allowing ground on such a social credit system is that it breeds room for more draconian rules. Those that are a tad bit extra. Say this one, for dogs for example. The eastern Chinese city of Jinan started enforcing a social credit system for dog owners in 2017, whereby pet owners get points deducted if the dog is walked without a leash or causes public disturbances. 
those who lost all their points had their dogs confiscated and had to take a test on regulations required for pet ownership. The CCP has taken naming and public shaming to a whole new level. A 2016 official government notice even encourages companies to consult the blacklist before hiring people or giving them contracts just to make sure their social credit is in the right. That's quite something coming from the nation's officials themselves. On the brighter side, these things do not happen in the shadows. You have a fighting chance, or the illusion of one, depending on who you are. If you feel you have been wrongly put to task, you can fight it within the legal system. How it works is that you'll be notified by the courts before they are added to the list. You are then allowed to appeal against this decision within 10 days of receiving the notification. Despite this, the Chinese justice system leaves much to be desired. More than not, there are no genuine protections for the people and entities subject to the system. A big part of this comes down to the one thing I mention frequently when it comes to China. There is no separation of church and state. To go against the CCP is to go against the law, and vice versa. Regulations that can be largely apolitical on the surface can be political when the Communist Party of China decides to use them for political purposes. Let me give you an example. In April 2018, the Civil Aviation Administration of China sent letters to international airlines demanding they show Taiwan as a part of China, saying the government would make a record of your company's serious dishonesty and take disciplinary actions for any that didn't comply. With this kind of peer pressure, eventually they all complied to the detriment of Taiwan. That very system used to pressure the airlines was a pilot of the civil aviation industry credit measures, which is part of the official social credit system. So that was, in fact, an element of the social credit system at work on an international scale. Alongside the potential for abuse of power, the knock-on effects of statewide surveillance, and the likelihood of incorrect data, it's also critical to note the negative potential this system has within society itself. It can very easily spiral into a divided society where people classify each other based on social rankings. Can you imagine that? It would be a nightmare of a show, a crazy dystopian future with no hope. Honestly though, not to sound insensitive, but this sounds like a script for a good end of times movie. Someone call James Cameron or Steven Spielberg for me. Anyway. While it's easy to focus on the punishments and the negativity that come with that, I must cover all sides. There is a reward-based side to the social credit system too. People with good scores can speed up travel applications to places like Europe as any hurdles are promptly cleared for them. An unidentified woman in Beijing told the BBC in 2015 that she was able to book a hotel without having to pay a cash deposit because she had a good score. On top of that, it's reported that by her, China's biggest dating site is boosting the profiles of good citizens. So there you have it, folks. Struggling to get a date? Just be a good citizen, and your match will be much easier to find. In addition to having the man or woman of your dreams that much closer to finding you, citizens with good social credit can also get discounts on energy bills, rent things without deposits, and get better interest rates at banks. Can't even lie, those sound like pretty sweet perks if you ask me. You can see how they can work as motivators for the masses to behave. As of August 2022, the province of Liaoning is even considering rewarding its residents who choose to donate blood as a way to improve overall health outcomes, according to a public statement. Quite cheeky, but I can see how the job can get done. So, having discussed all this, what does the future of China look like, and what is to become of its citizens in light of the social credit system? Well, to be frank, the full extent of the impact on social credit to Chinese citizens is impossible to say, simply because the system doesn't fully exist yet. Or better phrased, the system hasn't fully been implemented yet. As of last year, over 62 different social credit system pilot programs have been implemented by local governments, and this number has grown even more. The pilot programs began following the release of the 2014 planning outline for the construction of a social credit system by Chinese authorities and have continued to date, with each iteration becoming much smoother than the one before it. Because the system is continuously evolving, it's hard to say what the true reality of it is, but we can have glimpses from the iterations to work with, however biased this then makes us as a society. More likely, the reality of the social credit system will lie somewhere between the government's claims and the Western media's description of horror-filled dystopias. What is clear, judging from the international reception the social credit system has gotten from China, 
is that the rest of the world won't be in a hurry to implement it in individual countries globally. Oftentimes in the US, comparisons are drawn between private applications like Uber and its rating system for customers and drivers. Despite their own shortcomings, such systems are fundamentally different from what the CCP is attempting to do in the nation. Given the CCP's history with gross human rights violations, some of which are continuing to this day, it's hard to imagine a future where they do not weaponize the social credit system. It's only a matter of time before the full realities are revealed. And I wonder what side history will Demas' having been on when the dust settles on China's social credit system. Only time will tell.